Okay, looks like we are live. Turns out this live thing will be over in two weeks, and I just figured it out. <laughs> Thanks to the thought. Hey, looks like we are live. So hold on one now, second, I'm going to fix this. this. <laughs> You have to mute the um, uh, chat page you have up there, or yeah, close that's it down. what I did, but I couldn't mute it until it started. <laughs> yeah, did you have the? Uh, do you have the pop out chat or that whole page? I got the whole page. Uh, you can do a pop out and just have the chat section if you want. Oh, just, if you go to the right, you see these three dots. Yeah. Click, click to that, and then it says pop out. Okay. Cool. Okay, so you, then, then you save the pop out and you get rid of the rest of it. Thank you guys so much. Um, tonight, you guys, I asked Brother Luke and uh, Brother Dave to come over and discuss our blessed assurance in Christ. Because uh, a lot of people are saying once saved, always saved. Our blessed assurance is a doctrine of devils. It's a de See, the reason people think you can lose salvation is because they think it has something to do with them. But it isn't. Salvation's of the Lord. It's it's based on something done a long time ago. And you either believe it and you have it or you don't. And that's why people come against it. The, Spirit of the, truth, the Holy Spirit reveals to us. Uh, I'm going to read one verse and I'm going to turn it over to these guys. Uh, but First Peter, just to give you one verse, in uh, First Peter 1, it says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So who keeps us saved? God does. We're kept by the power of God. Now, we were just discussing some people that fall away. Um, I fear a lot of times. Now, if a, per a true saved person does fall away, they don't lose salvation. God will always bring them back to truth. We have the Holy Spirit that has witness to that truth. But I believe that there are some that just go along with it because it's religion, but they never got convinced of the truth of Christ, who he is and what he's accomplished. And so they just move on to the next best thing, looking for a quick fix. And uh, we're going to talk about our blessed assurance tonight. So uh, I wanted to introduce Brother Luke. You all know him at Sin City Preacher. Take it away, Brother Luke. Hmm. Hey, hey, praise Jesus, our great Savior God. <laughs> well, I know we're going to go over some scriptures tonight uh, about eternal security, but I guess I'll give you an opening thought here. Uh, many of you who know me, uh, you, you know that I'm using the term Christian rather than Christian, and I'm trying to popularize that term. I hope others will adopt it and start saying, you know, what. Uh, referring to themselves as a Christian. And the reason this is so important and so helpful is because the whole problem really starts with uh, people not understanding that it's not about you, it's not about me, it's about Christ. We have to understand who this person is, what he's done for us, what he accomplished, his promise to us, his guarantee to us. It's all about him, 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 Jesus, 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 Christ. I'm relying completely on Christ for my salvation. And uh, that is the distinction that uh, we need to understand um, and believe, because if you are um, one of... Uh, you know, a billion people who call themselves Christian of some kind, you ask them, what does that mean? What is a Christian? You'll get a hundred different definitions and explanations. And that's because Christian doesn't really mean anything to the world. Uh, it's, it's a jumbled mess. Almost all of Christianity is a works-based system, and it's based upon you, not Christ. So we need to understand the Bible tells us that this faith is, is Christianity. It's about Christ, his promise of eternal life to us. And when we understand that, then we're never going to be confused, uh, worrying about if we've done enough. Uh, we're never going to be worried and afraid that we might lose our salvation if, because we've misbehaved, because it's not about us. It, someone, uh, Sister Lisa, she used to say, it's not a sin issue. It's a son issue. 
So people need to realize that the sin issue is resolved. Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. So don't obsess over your sin and thinking that, oh, I got to get the sin out of my life and I better do good deeds and hope it all stacks up and, and if the judgment God approves of what I've done. Forget about that. Jesus did it all. It's not what you do. It's what Jesus did for you. And so, um, yeah, we're going to, we're going to want sin out of our life, but we get sin out of our life by focusing on the sun. All right, that's my opening thoughts. Sorry, my mouth was stuck. Um, hey, um, we also brought over Brother Dave, and he's not feeling too great. He did something to his back, so I'm grateful that he showed up with us. Oh, I'm all right. I'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Brother Dave. Man, what a blessed assurance that we have. Uh, you know, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Who? Who is the one who lived the perfect sinless life and fulfilled all the requirements of God's perfect and righteous law on my behalf? Who is the one whose life I will be saved through? None other than Jesus. How can I add myself or my merit or my efforts or my performance to what Christ has already completed? God hasn't asked me to be perfect. God has asked me to allow him to grow me in his grace. But God has required of me to put my faith and my trust in his son for my salvation. For the Bible says, whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The question is, do you truly believe it? Hey Amen. We just had um, Shark, Shark Friends has been a viewer for a while. And I fear that a lot of people, um, they they listen to false teachers and it, they hear them twist scripture and turn the focus from Jesus and what he did onto us and our performance. And he says, you know, I'm just a confused. I mean, who's going to end up in heaven? Nobody. Well, here's the thing. The way is narrow because the way is a person. The way is narrow because there's only one way. And it's through Jesus. Uh, it's not narrow because it's difficult. Uh, although, to humble yourself and realize that you don't have anything to bring to the table for salvation and to just trust your Savior that did it for you. Maybe that is hard. It seems to be hard for a lot of people because it goes against our very um, thought that man is good in some way. That we've got something that we can do to either get, keep, prove, maintain salvation. And it's unfortunate because it takes our eyes off of Christ and what he accomplished. Salvation is of the Lord. It's based on the work of Christ and his atoning work. Uh, the fact that he died and paid the punishment. He he fulfilled God's law. He's the only one that ever did. And he fulfilled it. And when we're in him, his righteousness is imputed to us. And we fulfill it vicariously through him. Just like he became uh, our sin, we become his righteousness. And that's a gift of righteousness. Once we're saved, salvation is just the beginning of a Christian's life. What people are mixing up is our walk with the Lord. They're mixing that walk up with something that has to do with saving us or keeping us saved. But you saw St. Peter clearly said that we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. That's how we're kept by God. Paul makes, I, I don't remember the verse, maybe one of you guys can find it, where Paul talks about how we're preserved by God. It's, it's God preserving his saints. He's Amen. not going to pick somebody up from the beginning. You know, it's, it's known from the foundation of the world who'd be his. He's not going to choose that person only to lose them. And there's so many verses that salvation is of the Lord and it's in God's hands, not ours. Um, I have a few points to make as to why you can't lose it. But I want to know if Brother Luke and... Um, Brother Dave wanted to go ahead and uh, give any verses, that, your favorite verses on our eternal security. Brother Luke, did you have any? 
yeah, I have a I have a ton of verses on this. I uh, I got saved 32 years ago, and all that time I've been saving verses uh, on subjects. I have a file on verses that prove faith alone, verses that prove the deity of Christ, verses that prove eternal security. So I've got some verses I can uh, give you tonight. Uh, but first, let me say that there's uh, there are many verses, uh, and I'm sure we'll go over them tonight, uh, that are explicit, and they they are uh, they are targeted on this very subject that that uh, we cannot lose our salvation. However, in addition to those verses, we could provide you with a hundred or two hundred or three hundred other verses that are not explicitly about eternal security, but the, the assumption that we should get from these other verses is the inference that uh, when we read the verse, we should also conclude that verse is teaching us eternal security. Uh, um, any verse that says that you're, you're saved by believing or you're saved by your faith uh, or, or, or that you will not perish, uh, all of these verses uh, are uh, stating eternal security because uh, the, the idea of, of you're saved means it's done. You will be saved means it's promised. Uh, it's guaranteed. You have been saved means it's settled. So all of these verses that are uh, stated like that about salvation, there's hundreds of them. But then we have quite a few others that I said, that these are specifically uh, designed is written exactly for this very purpose tonight. Well, but uh, let me suggest that we start off with with this one here. This idea. If this is Numbers twenty three nineteen, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken? And shall he not make it good? Uh, so the idea that um, God cannot lie uh, is foundational to this whole idea. Because if, if God says that you have eternal life because you believe in Jesus, God cannot lie. So that's uh, that. That is the most important thing that we we are not promised uh, eternal life by a philosopher or a, a prophet or, or a, a, a Bible teacher or even our own intuition. We are promised this from God. God cannot lie. God cannot break a promise. I've got a lot of other verses, but I'll uh, suggest we talk about that one first. Yeah, uh, what people don't realize is when you say you I, i'm gonna let brother dave give his verse to one one of his verses and we'll talk about the two you guys just had but one of the uh issues here is people don't realize when they say once saved always saved is a doctrine of devils they are blaspheming the holy spirit because they are denying the witness god gave of his son the report that he gave i was just that's life. the verse i was going to use <laughs> oh well you go ahead and do that read the whole verse but i just wanted to say it is blaspheming god to say yep. that you can lose something that he promises you like brother luke just said go ahead brother dave i'm sorry yep and and just to uh just to roll off what renee said i'm going to read first john chapter 5 verses 4 through 13 so everyone has an understanding for whatever is born of god Whatsoever is born of God, meaning reborn of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said we must be born again. Overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there many, are three. How many? Say that again. These three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. 
Now, our blessed assurance is found in verses 9 through 13. It says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. He that believes on the son of God has the witness in himself. He that believes not God has made God a liar. Because he does not believe the record that God gave his son. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And how do we have the Son? By believing the record. Thank you. So let me uh, one more time. Uh, if you don't believe the record, you've made God a liar. Uh huh. So, and the record is that eternal life is in Christ. And if we have him, we have it. Right. Very, very true. Because God specifically says, God specifically says, um, hang on. There it is in verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God has the witness in himself. Right, wait, right, right there. Stop right there. What would you say about people that deny the truth that all of us born-again Christians know? That we That's know we're saved. There's nothing that can be done to make us unsaved. That witness. Why they lack the witness. Do not have it? No, they don't have the witness. Why, why would they not have the witness? Because they made God a liar. And it says why? It says, he that believeth not God has made him a liar. Why? Because he believes not the record that God gave of his son. Mm -hmm. And this so is the right. record. It says in the very next verse, this is the record. That so God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son... Hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So the reason they don't have the witness that tells them they have eternal life is because they don't believe. They've that's never right. believed the promise of God. And that's, that's right. That that means either they're uh lost and have never believed, and the Holy Spirit's not bearing witness to this truth. Right. Or they're babes in Christ, and if they're babes in Christ, they shouldn't be going around trying to refute things until they know <laughs> what's going on anyway. Well, God right. says that he gave the record, and the record that God has given is that God has given to us eternal life. Not temporal life, not probationary life, but the record that God said we must agree with and believe is that he gave us eternal life, and that eternal life... If that eternal life ceases to be eternal, it was never eternal to begin right. with. But God says that that eternal life is in his son. Not a single mention of you and your merit or your duty or your deeds or your performance whatsoever. People believe you can lose it because they, they don't understand that our blessed assurance actually helps us love God, grow in gratitude to God. And there's a desire to, to please him because of what he's done for us. It doesn't work the way they think it does. They think if you're not being, if you're not being, what was it, Brother Luke? We held over hell with a piece of string. What did that one pastor from the Puritan? What that guy? Jonathan Edwards, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Like yeah, a, that was like it. A, you're held by a spider web over fire. <laughs> um, I got these uh, verses you were uh, thinking about. Yes, um, we agree that we're being preserved. First Thessalonians five twenty three says, "And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ." And the other one with. Being, not being preserved is Jude 1.1. 1, 1. Jude, the, 
the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Uh, now, um, Curtis Hudson is the greatest preacher I've ever heard. I but love it. I love it. I got, I got a playlist, uh, a collection of some of his sermons here, and he did a great sermon on being preserved and uh, rather than persevere, you know, because the Calvinist doctrine in TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, the acronym, the last part of it, the P, stands for perseverance. And the Calvinist teaches that we must persevere in good works and in our faith. Uh, otherwise, it proves you're not really saved. So if you have any lapses in faith or if you have any uh, uh, lapses in a good life, then uh, it proves you never really got saved according to Calvinism. Uh, but the, the P should be understood correctly, not as perseverance on our part, but preservation on the part of Christ. Christ preserves us. He, he keeps us. And uh, so this idea of being preserved is the right way of looking at that. Rather than Amen, Brother Luke. They teach perseverance, but the Bible teaches preservation by the power of God. And the promise of God. So they're the Calvinists are just flat work salvationists. They just they just um, switch their words around to make it seem like they're doctrinally correct by grace through faith, but then they redefine what faith is and grace too. So right. it's, just, it's just not biblical, and uh, no, nobody's getting anywhere because of their own perseverance and efforts. It's it's just ridiculous. And it's blatant work salvation. And the, the way you can tell it's works is to whom is it pointing? And this is how they get around that day. They'll just say, well, it's God doing it in me. Right. So if God's not doing it in you, you're not really saved. It's just their way of adding works. Right. Do it. Justif right. Justifying because they can't fathom that it's trusting Christ alone. So they have to have a quote unquote physical proof or an evidential proof. Even though Romans 4, 5 says to them that worketh not, but believeth on him, his faith is counted for righteousness. Right. Uh, should we produce fruit? Yes. Should we produce, uh, you know, growing in grace? Yes. Should we, uh, you know, produce obedience? Yes. Is everyone going to produce the same amount? No. Is everyone going to get to the same level of spiritual maturity? No. This is why Paul addressed the immature carnal believers in Corinth yep. and said, listen, you guys are just babes. You guys aren't growing. You ought to grow. But, you know, it, he did, He addressed them as brethren. So we see from biblical evidence that there are people that just don't go on to maturity. And we exhort them to do so. Right. But we ourselves have to be careful because we may not even go unto the maturity that we'd like to go unto. Right. Well, I mean, all of the apostles' letters, all of Paul's letters, almost all of them are, are one, they're remind, he reminds them of their foundation. Two, reminds them who God says they are in Christ. And three exhorts them, encourages them to suffer the persecution and so forth with joy, and also to grow, to live the way God says you already are in his eyes. So he's always um, encouraging them to live godly and holy. It's just not part of what saves them. And so that's what people before, can't get. Go ahead, before, brother. Before I joined you for this program, I, I was listening to... Uh, a teaching from Malcolm Smith. And if anybody's not familiar with Malcolm Smith, uh, uh, I'm going to put his channel up as one of my, on my list of recommended channels. Um, but Malcolm Smith is one of the greatest Bible teachers. Oh, wow. Uh, Curtis, by Curtis Hudson, uh, he's a great preacher. Malcolm Smith's a great teacher. So I highly recommend them both. But Malcolm Smith was making a point about the word gospel. He's talking about metanoia. Uh, as being an interesting idea. He, you know how we say metanoia is a change of mind? Yeah. Uh, he, says, he says it's an exchange of mind. And I've never heard anybody express it that way. But your mind is changed to the mind of Christ. You're in agreement with Christ. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, an exchange of mind uh, rather than just a, simply a change of mind. But he also said gospel. Of course, we know the word gospel in Greek. It translates to good news. 
but he was making a big deal about it the way I like to do. It's not good news, it's great news. He said that great news is magnificent news. It's news that makes a man jump for joy. Amen. Now we know why Luke's always doing happy. Yeah. Now, <laughs> how many times have you heard me say that when a person believes and they understand the significance, the monumental uh, of the uh, the magnificence of what has just happened? They don't get. Look, you never have to worry when you die. When you trust your Savior, it's done. You, he will. He, you know he answers your prayers. He hears your prayers. You're never alone. God himself dwells within you. You will never be under his condemnation. And you know that when you step out of this body, you'll be present <coughs> for it. That is the best news ever. And that is the free gift of eternal life. Okay, if it's, so if it's, sad people deny it. If we have salvation, if we have eternal life, we have peace and joy. And we can jump for joy. We can have peace and joy every day. Right. But if it's not salvation, if the gospel is actually probation and you're, you believe that, okay, now I believe Jesus is my Savior and he's God. And he paid for my sins. Now I'm on probation. I'm saved, but I, 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 I better behave. As soon as I get out of line, I'm in trouble with God now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that probation is not salvation. How could a person jump for joy if I told them, for, okay, now you're a Christian. From now you're on probation. You're okay, but you get out of line and you're in lo you've lost it. There's no good news in that. You cannot jump for joy with that message. And you know what? If you ask every one of them, if a mass murderer was on his deathbed and asked God for forgiveness, if he just said, "I'm trusting you to save me, Jesus," would they be saved? They'd all say yes. They'd all say yes. But if that same guy got saved ten years earlier. And didn't live right for those 10 years he lost his salvation or he wasn't saved to begin with like they can't get it they can't get that if if you get saved and you're a child of god you are now uh, uh everyone that names the name of christ depart from iniquity because now you're his child and he chastens everyone he rebukes and chastens those he loves he doesn't want bad for you you're supposed to serve him once you're saved we all agree in that, but that service has to come from a place of gratitude and love. And you can't have the kind of gratitude and love if you're not sure, if you still think you're being judged on your performance. And by the way, you'll never be good enough. Never. Shark fans, you know what you need to do? Realize it doesn't matter how good you live. You're still not good enough. Now, when you get to that point, when the law stops your mouth to the point where you know you can't please God in your flesh by performance in order to earn salvation, that's when you can drop at the foot of the cross and say, I got it. I can't do it. I got to trust what Christ did alone. Amen. You amen. Rest in that. And then he will help guide you on how you should be living. I mean, he's, he lives within us. He'll tell us what's right. Right. Uh, there are people that uh, want to make a distinction uh, of believing on Jesus and comparing it to believing in Jesus. Uh, they both really mean the same thing. There are subtle, subtle differences that I can make. But believing, if you believe on Jesus for your salvation, you're saved. If you believe in Jesus for your salvation, you're saved. But if you believe in Jesus as well, I believe he really exists. He's a real historical figure. I believe that about Jesus. That's not what we're talking about here. Here, let's look at Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which be, hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So, so believing uh, in Jesus means you're, you have confidence in him. You believe he's going to do what he promised he would do for you. You're going to go to heaven because Jesus promised. It. He is faithful to keep that promise. So I believe in Jesus's ability. No one has the ability to give me eternal life. No one has the ability to get me, get me into heaven except Jesus. And I also believe in what he accomplished. So sin is not preventing me because he paid for my sins. I believe in his faithfulness to keep the promise so 
I believe Jesus guaranteed me eternal life. I'm confident, and that's what we expect anybody to have. If you are a believer, you should have this confidence, this blessed assurance. I'm going to go to heaven and settle. Nothing can change it because Jesus promised it to me. Brother Luke, Amen. <laughs> we got this same thing, Brother Dave and Brother Luke. Well, even if they stay in the sin of homosexuality, let me just say something here. I don't know why this sin is like set apart is like some sin that can't be forgiven. I don't look bottom line is you get saved by trusting in Christ. Nobody's getting to heaven because they lived right. Okay. Nobody's doing that. You're saved because you trusted what the savior did. You believe the record, right? And then once you're saved, we can all know, that sexual immorality is sin. Whether it's homosexuality or adultery or fornication, it's all sin. Okay? It's it's no different than any other sin. It comes with earthly consequence and loss of reward. Okay? It has nothing to do with salvation. Being gay or straight has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with chastisement, blessing on this earth, uh, open doors for Satan to destroy your life on this earth, but it has nothing to do with salvation. Eternal life really is a free gift. It has nothing to do with how you live. I don't know why people set that one sin apart. Like it's, you know, y'all want to talk about that? Yeah, real quickly though, sister, I saw a guy named Kurt ask a question in the comments a while back. I just want to answer him really quickly because I got my Bible open to that spot actually. He, um, he was asking about Romans 11. What did God mean about um, continuing in his goodness unless they fail the severity of God? But real quick, so, so Brother Kurt, so you understand, I want you to know that Romans 11 is addressing two separate people. It's addressing Israel and it's addressing the Gentiles. Now, how do we know this? Because we see in Romans 10, Paul opens the book of Romans 10 saying, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear witness of them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So you go over to Romans 11 and you see that Paul is in the opening uh, uh, verses or the opening uh, first couple of verses of uh, Romans 11, Paul is saying, look, I was once a Jew. And, you know, just because the Jews were God's chosen people doesn't mean they're automatically going to heaven. They have to come in through faith. And if God blinded some through their unbelief, Paul then turns his attention to the Gentiles and says, if God didn't even spare the natural branches, but broke them off due to their unbelief, you Gentiles don't think that you get some free pass either. You have to believe. You have to put faith in God to be grafted in to those branches. Yeah, a lot of people try to use that as a salvific loss, and that's nonsense. The, the nation of Israel was a chosen, set-apart, holy nation for the Savior of the world to be born through. That was the point of Israel. He would come through Jacob. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Jacob was chosen for the Savior to be born through. One but of the bond woman, one of the three. That didn't automatically give them <laughs> eternal life. Um, they were looking forward to the cross. The animal sacrifices uh, was a shadow of, of, of the cross that would save them. But once the truth of who the Savior was came about and then they rejected him, uh, they're lost too. I mean, everybody is saved by trusting in Christ. That's the way we're saved. It, uh, it even talked about Jesus went uh, and preached to the dead uh, in Sheol uh, while yeah. uh, in in the heart of the earth those three days. So, um, well, see, Rome, Romans eleven can be really difficult if people don't understand that Paul is is drawing a contrast. Between Israel and the Gentiles, yeah, that, and that, and that, good. and that, both of them, even being separate uh, uh, people, need to be as one people through faith in Christ. Right. So Paul's Paul's just giving the illustration that uh, even Israel, who God had chose, some of the natural branches were broken off because of their unbelief. Right. So you, as a Gentile, come to Christ by faith and, and remain in His goodness through your faith. 
Yes. And if and, and it's saying that if, even if the Gentiles are to go into unbelief, then then God then they will not you know they will not be grafted in. So in other words, Paul's just illustrating between Israel and the Gentiles that we are all made one in Christ through faith. It's about unbelief and belief. And it's a warning not to reject Christ. That's right. It's like Hebrews was a warning not to reject Christ. Sorry, brother Lee, you put you put something over here. Uh, no, I uh, I already talked about Philippians, but uh, oh, okay. I'll bet I'll mention another verse. But first, let me say I, I was talking about uh, believing in Jesus or believing on Jesus. Either way, you're going to be saved. But uh, the way I understand believing on is uh, I'm a Christian. That means I'm depending on Christ. I'm not thinking that I'm going to try to get there through my own efforts or that I'm making some kind of contr contribution and, and I'm working my way and striving for salvation. I'm depending on Christ. I'm relying on Christ. Um, so uh, whether you're going to depend, rely on uh, Christ, believe on Christ, or you're believing in Christ and his ability and his faithfulness to give you eternal life, uh, these are ways of understanding what this faith means. It's about not putting any faith in yourself, no faith in self. All faith is in Jesus. Hey, uh, Brother Luke, Pastor Tim Henderson is in the chat. We got 110 people. Wow. Wow. Um, Pastor Tim, do you want to join us? I'll be happy to email you the link. I will say the uh, Holy Spirit is moving in this time. I'm telling you, people are people are coming out of of legalism. People are coming out of lordship. People are coming out of twisted understandings, and God is simply through the foolishness of preaching allowing his word to harmonize and flow and and give understanding and people are coming out of their condemnation and out of their confusion and they're coming to a place of full trust on christ and then god is sealing them with his spirit it's in a it's a beautiful thing to witness yeah we forgot to mention the uh sealed by the holy spirit until the day of redemption that god seals you salvations of god I have a list of reasons that I'll put up. Oh, so Sister Renee, I didn't, I didn't know you wanted God. verses. I could shoot off about thirty of them. <laughs> Renee, you think, you think, is the night over? Or something we haven't forgotten. It's on our list. What? How do no, you think well, you forgot true. that verse? That's true. That's true. Okay, but I want, I want to say this. The, uh, I mentioned that some verses are explicitly about being preserved. And being uh, confident that he's going to complete it for us, and and uh, these are really eternal security verses. That's what the verse is trying wants to communicate to us. But there's other verses that people don't even consider that this is an eternal security verse. What is the most famous verse in the Bible? Is John three sixteen. John three sixteen. This is eternal security verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, whoever believes in Jesus, shall not perish. Thank okay. you. That's a promise it, from God. Shall not. Is that future? Luke? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a promise from God, and God cannot lie. God cannot break his promise. So you will not perish. If you put your faith in Jesus, you promise you will not perish. Instead, you have everlasting life. How long does everlasting life last? exactly can we ever lose everlasting life exactly if you have life now and i tell you that life goes on forever how long does it last it lasts forever i, I don't know why people can't get that they it says we have passed as in we did we did pass from death why well, if you're going to keep on mentioning these verses let me pull them up for you oh, here. Go ahead. <laughs> okay i'll get it I'll go ahead and talk. I'll find that verse. It's on my hey, list. Hey, Renee, you opened up with First Peter, correct? Yes. Kept by the power just, of God, me, by faith unto salvation until the last yes. day. Yes. The verses you opened up with are very powerful. Just let me give a quick, while Luke's right looking here. for those verses, I want to give a real quick, like, minute or two explanation go of ahead, just how bro. powerful these verses are. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to to our good deeds and our greatness and our ability to obey at every whim 
No, that's not what it says, guys. It says, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again. That means he has rebirthed our spirit with his Holy Spirit. We are born of an incorruptible seed, sealed unto the day of redemption, purchased as a, uh, a possession of God. And look what it says. It says, unto a living hope. Not a living fear, not a living doubt, but a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To what? To an inheritance incorruptible. It cannot be corrupted. Undefiled. You cannot defile it. It fades not away. That means it is forever reserved in heaven for you. Let me ask you a question. If you were to call the, uh, let's say you were to call an event and you are going to order uh, VIP parking, not VIP, but whatever the dumb example I'm using is. Let's just say you called ahead somewhere and you reserved yourself a parking spot. Okay. The following week you go to the event, you drive to the event, even though there's a bunch of cars in the parking lot, there is a spot that has been reserved for you by the owner or the person who's putting together the event. It's the same principle with God. It says to an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, and is reserved in heaven for you. Reserved in heaven for you. And how can it be reserved? Because of God. It says, verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Folks, you have to have trust in God's promises. If God says that when he saves you, he gives you an inheritance that is incorruptible, then that's what it means. The apostles sound like they want people worried that maybe they're not going to be saved. No, every one of them encourages the saints. Look what's set before you. Look at the hope you have before you. Sister, they do that because they themselves are not, a, they themselves are not sure. They do that to others because they themselves don't know. They destroy people's faith by saying you can lose it. But the apostles are constantly t uh, telling them, look at the, the hope set before you. Look, it's the mercy of God. Look what he's done. And because he's done this for you, because you have that hope ahead of you, not a hope like we'll hope so, a hope like a, a sure promise. Something that we know we're looking forward to. The apostles always confirm that. Look what Peter's doing. First thing of his letter, he's saying, look at the inheritance God has set before you. Keep going. Suffer the persecution. It's going to be okay because it, it doesn't compare to what God has for you. He's always confirming what they've been promised. He never tells them that you'll lose it. He does nothing but edify them because he, that's the way that you get a person to live for God. Is, is so they can grow in love with God, you know, not not legalistically, but because they know he has saved them. That's right. And they, and they uh, diamond justification ain't never lied. <laughs> they I don't know if it's a he or she. I don't know if it's a he or she, but diamond justification in the chat said, even when you corner them with nothing but the simple truths of the word of God and the gospel and our blessed assurance, they pull out things out of thin air because they just cannot bring themselves to humbly admit that it's Christ alone. And, and so this is what I wanted to encourage people. When you get familiar with our blessed assurance, when you get familiar with the person and the finished work of Christ, God will begin to use you by using the foolishness of preaching, the simple things to confound the so-called wise. You will be able to back people into corners with simple, basic logical questions and once they get backed into a corner they will either flee or they will just give up because if they continue they will have to admit that their views are flawed and contradicting hey let me suggest hey, I, I made a video uh recently. Wait, wait did frank oh hi frank hey i'm sorry i didn't you know see you guys let luke, uh, let luke say what he's gonna say and we'll introduce you Oh, my name is Frank, by the way. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I'm from the Netherlands. I was born in Germany. And now since a year of three, I was being brought on the heavy persecution or lordship salvation thing that uh, brought me down. Uh, 
into condemnation until I realized it is finally finished. And now that I have this assurance of blessings, I know that I am in Christ and there is no more condemnation. That's fantastic, brother. And I thank the Lord for what he's blessing me with, uh, with anything else like fruit trees or anything that comes, yeah, you know, without money or something. Uh, that he's laying on my heart what I like to do best, you know, the things that I love. He brings it up to me, the things that are honorable and uh, profitable. That is what he's going to bring me. I know I don't deserve it, but somehow I trust in him that he's uh, indeed providing me with the things that I never thought of. Like uh, the creation, from the creation of the world to the uh, providing to the, how do they call it, uh, prophets? that God was always the first who made it up with man instead of man making it up with God. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Thank that's you. Right. I I want to let, uh, okay. let me let Luke finish his point real quick, okay? So we are... Okay, thank, thank you. Give me just a sec. Go ahead, Luke. All right. Uh, the, I made a video a few days ago. I think it was titled something like... Uh, fighting against lordship heretics and uh, it was not a real long video maybe 20 minutes but i'm i hope everybody will watch it because i'm giving you my opinion and my advice strategically how to carry on this fight this argument against a lordship heretic we we make a big mistake i'm including myself i don't do this anymore but i've done it in the past of always be on the defensive and they pummel us with verses and we're we're explaining one problem verse after another and i said we need to reverse it on them and put them on the defensive and force them to explain our proof texts and and these people are not going to let us teach them they they don't have ears to hear they're full of pride and self-righteousness so even if they were persuaded they're not going to ever admit it they can't. They can't admit that they could lose. You better problems. preach that, brother Luke. You better preach that truth. So I'm saying the strategy we should be doing is tell them, look, you say that you've studied the Bible for many years. You must be really an expert. Perhaps you can help me understand this verse. Would you interpret this verse for me? Here, I, I could give you 50 different verses like this, but th this is what I just posted. It says John 5:24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Shall but, not. But is passed from death unto life. Now, we're going to discuss that. But my, what I'm saying is when we have a verse like this that proves our doctrine, we ask them to read the verse. We ask them to teach the meaning of the verse to us. We probe with a lot of questions about the deep meanings of the verse, forcing them to learn, teach themselves. And that, that's the way that we need to uh, deal with these people. But getting back to this verse, it says, uh, if, when you believe on him, you have, you have it. If you've already got it. And if it's everlasting, it lasts forever. You cannot lose it. And it says, and you shall not come into condemnation. So that's so, now and later, Luke. Not only you only have everlasting life, how long does it last? Forever. And you shall never come into condemnation. No, not ever. And you've already passed from death unto life. It's already done. Yep. So yep. And nothing in the future. It says it shall not come. It doesn't say. Will come into condemnation if you might come, much, may come, possibly or, come. You know, if you if you don't live a certain way, you will come into condemnation. No, uh, you'll never. That's what people are confusing eternal life. You know, getting to heaven with uh, something they're earning because they're being good now. No, that that's for anybody that trusts Christ because He came to save us. Now, how you serve Him and live while you're here on the earth can determine your longevity of your life. It can be blessing and cursing on this earth. 
and it can be a reward okay. and loss of it, but not salvation. They're it, it can also it can also keep the hand of God's divine discipline off your rear end. Mm -hmm. Right. Here, right. Let Chastisement. A, let me give you a picture uh, of a problem and there and, and versus the right way, way of uh, imagining this is that Roman Catholicism. Uh, as it developed in the, in the second, third, fourth, fifth centuries, what happened was uh, the, these church fathers, they would meet and they'd have these councils and they'd discuss theology and they wrote a lot of creeds and the creeds were very helpful defining the Godhead. But the, what the problem was during that same time, they moved away from faith alone as Paul taught it and they started teaching that uh, you've got to have water baptism, and there's a particular method of water baptism that has to be followed, and and you have to take the communion, and 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 then you have to confess your sins. What says that? That's Roman Catholicism, and that was in the second, third centuries, where it was, became a cycle. Uh, you confess your sins, you have communion, you're in good standing. When you sin again, you got to go back and confess your sins and get communion again. So it's an on. So, in other words, imagine if you have to take communion to get your, that's why excommunication in Roman Catholicism is so crucial, uh, so um, such a horrible death sentence. If, the, if someone gets excommunicated in Roman Catholicism, it's not the way we think of excommunicating where we kick them out of the congregation. Excommunication in Roman Catholicism means you cannot participate in communion. If you do not take the Eucharist, you cannot have this bread of life and you can't you can't go to heaven. So they think you gotta have this communion. So on one minute, hand, that, that puts man in charge of salvation. But what, what they really what they the way we would understand it is okay, this is a one time event. We we uh if we're going to eat something like the bread of life, or let's say it was a pill. Let's say that we had some kind of a medication or a pill or some breakthrough. Take this pill one time and it changes your body and now you're going to live forever, okay? It's a it's an eternal life pill. You take it once, it's done, you never have to take it again. This is the way we understand it, salvation. It's an event, it happens, it's done. You don't have to keep on doing it day after day. But the Romanism and the lordship and the works uh, system is based upon uh, you got to keep, keep it up, keep working, do, 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 but no... Christianity is, it's done. It's done. So the true faith, Brother Luke, is you receive something that's already been completed by Christ. When you receive it, you don't have to keep receiving it because you got it already. When you trusted in Christ, you believed the message of his death, burial, and resurrection that washed our sins away. And therefore, we will never come into condemnation because I can't pay for the same sin Jesus already paid for. And the reason is men are thinking carnally that the future sins are. But I, I wasn't even born when he died. He died for the sins of the whole world, past, present and future. That's how powerful. Do they realize that God came down in the flesh and paid our debt? That's how precious his blood is. And so. They turn it into, it sounds like what Luke was saying is they turn salvation into a process instead of a birth. A birth does not take a long time. It's an event. A birth is an event, not a process. And you're born of God when the Holy Spirit dwells within you. When you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ by faith, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That cannot be undone. You can't be unborn. It's an event. But like Brother Luke said, Lordship, <laughs> Roman Catholicism, they both make it a process of something you're doing. And yes. God is done. And when Jesus used the new birth with Nicodemus, it's, nobody could ever come up with a better example. You don't get born for, for 75 years. You're being born for 75 years. <laughs> Boy, I mean, the birth that your mother is going to go through for 75 years giving birth. So you're pretty born. Funny. No, you're born in a moment and it's done and it can never be undone. Okay. Yeah. Jesus used the example, and I, I've explained that a bunch of times. Jesus used Moses lifting up the bronze serpent in the wilderness as a shadow of being born again. Yes. What happened when he did that? Well, the Israelites have been bitten by venomous snakes, fiery serpents. And he told, God told Moses to build a pole 
and put a bronze serpent's image on it. The image of the serpent represents sin. That is the sin that would be lifted up in Jesus on a pole, on a cross. So the thing probably looked like this with a serpent wrapped around it. And they looked up at that with faith that they would be healed and not die from the serpent bites, from the effects of sin. It is just a shadow of how they were on their way to death, physical death, from the bite of a, a serpent. We are on our way to eternal death from the bite of the serpent of sin. And so when we look upon Christ crucified with faith, believing we're healed of that second death, we're born of God. It's the same thing. When the Israelites looked at Moses lifting up the bronze serpent, they looked upon it with faith, believed they would not die physically, and they lived. We look upon Christ wearing that snake, that serpent in his flesh, that sin, and we believe we are healed from the second death. It's the same. That's how Jesus described being born again. That is an event that occurs. If you're trusting Christ to not suffer the second death, to live forever because of what he has done for you, you have eternal life. And that's why people say you can lose it because they don't have it. They don't have the witness. Like Brother Dave was reading that verse. They don't have the witness in themselves. They make God a liar by not believing the record that God gave of us his son and in his son is eternal life. Brother Luke, that's funny. You don't get born for 75 years. Sister Renee, uh, somebody named Lee Jen in the comments said, if we cannot lose our salvation, why does the Bible say that God can blot our name out of the book of life? And I want to answer her really quickly. You that right if, she pays, if she pays close attention to Revelation chapter 3, and read uh, verses 5 and 6, she will see that it is not the case of any true believer getting blotted out. Those that get blotted out are those who die lost, who have rejected Christ. How do I know this? Let's look at Revelation chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not, not blot out his name, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Lee Jin, for you to understand why Jesus says he will not blot out the names of those who are overcomers and put on the white raiment. What does that mean? In 1 John chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Who is he that overcomes? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. What is the white raiment? That is the robe of righteousness imputed to us by Christ. Romans 4, 5 says, To him that worketh not, but believeth on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So notice Jesus said that if you believe on him, and you're born again of him, you receive his righteousness... You will not be blotted out. But those who do not receive Christ, reject Christ, remain in unbelief, go some other way, they will be blotted out of the book of life. I also want to explain that the book of life and the Lamb's book of life are not the same thing. All right, in the Bible, when you see the words book of life, you have to determine which one he's talking about. Blotting somebody out of the book of life would mean to kill them physical death to take them out of the book of life means they're out of the land of the living they're not alive anymore it means i'm going to take their life right blot them out of the book of the living right the lamb's book of life is the book of eternal life right i believe that when jesus christ died he died for the sins of the whole world everybody's name was written in that book and when you trust in him that name is in blood. It's permanent. Permanent. It even it actually it actually verifies eternal security. And th yeah, it does. And then those that reject him, they'll be taken out of that book. So everybody's that. name was in that book. Uh, it's just a way for us to understand it. You know, I I believe that. I believe once you trust in him, it's in blood. It's good. It's permanent. But those, as he showed you, were unbelievers because we overcome by our faith. That, that's how we're overcomers, by trusting. You know, like he said, who is he that uh, overcomes? But he that believes Jesus is the Son of God. So uh, these are unbelievers 
But you also, depending on the verse, have to determine which book it is. If, if, is it talking about the book of living, like to physically die? Or is it talking about the Lamb's book of life, which is eternal life? Let me say something. The uh, uh, Brother Dave, you uh, graciously uh, provided an answer to someone in the chat room. I don't remember the name of the person you were referencing that asked the question. But that's an example of what I was just talking about. Uh, I, I would tell that person, wait a second, are you not listening? What is wrong with you? Are you refusing to hear the verses that are clear and explicit? Why do you want to look at a book that's called Apocrypha, that's full of nothing but, but uh, symbols and, uh, and uh, pictures and, and uh, all kinds of things that everybody's arguing about the meaning of? Yeah, we can give you an answer to that. But why do you want to focus on that instead of the clear verses that we've already given you? <laughs> Here's another one. Here's another one to you, whatever you, whoever you are. Tell me what this verse means. John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Explain that verse to me. I mean, you you <laughs> should form your doctrinal conclusions on verses that are clear and explicit, rather than forming doctrines based upon verses that everybody's arguing about the meaning. Every one of us told you about all the verses in Revelation, for example, or all the different parables. You're going to get a different kind of answer from everybody. But a verse like this, who's going, who can possibly come to a different conclusion than this verse is clearly stating? If, 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 um, if you go to Jesus for your salvation, uh, he will in no wise cast you out. No way, no possible way will you ever get cast out if you come to him for salvation. And Brother Luke, who gives us the Jesus? Who gives us the Father? The Father gives us to Jesus. And why would the Father give us to Jesus if he was just going to lose us? Would the Father give anyone to his son that he would lose? Jesus said, I, I'd lose nothing. But they he, 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 pluck them out of my hands, he said. They, uh, that's right. And they always say, well, you can take yourself out. Then they shall never perish. perish. Man. Let no me man. get. Not you. Let me, I'm raising my hand, guys. I don't want to interrupt. Ahead, I have the thought right on my head right now Go as you ahead. said that. Safe in the Father's hand, safe in the Son's hand, safe by the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in the chat room have young children? How many of you are mothers or fathers of young children? Let me ask you this. You grab a hold of your child's hand. Are you telling me that no matter how hard they pull, kick or scream, they're able to break your grip? I don't think so. Just yeah, picture that arrogant. image. It's picture arrogant. that image in your mind for a moment of you being the adult parent, grabbing the wrist of your infant child, and no matter how much they pull, tug, push, kick, or scream, are they able to come out of your hand, yes or no? No, no they're not. not. And if they are, then you need to eat your Wheaties and do some push-ups. Well, but what i'm saying it's in god's hand salvation is in god's hand god has done it and they blaspheme when they say you can lose it because they're saying god is ineffective he can't keep us saved he's not the one that does it all it's not based on just christ the promises that god makes are not true i mean they don't realize how blasphemous it is to tell people you can lose salvation you know really I, I, i've uh, I, I we've all talked a lot over the years about the problem with all the isms uh Calvinism, Armenianism, Romanism, all, every kind of ism is, uh, we find something, there's flaws in all the isms. Some, they're damnable heresies. And I just thought of just now, based upon this question and answer we gave here, uh, there's another ism that I just learned about. It's, it's, the, it's the what about ism. So oh, what, yeah. <laughs> well, what about this? What about that? Well, I'm going to ask you, what about the verses we just showed you? Are you so stubborn and stiff-necked that you refuse to accept the clear, explicit verses we've already given you? And I can give you 10 more or 20 more, clearly, explicitly saying, like this one here, another one, 
Hebrews 7.25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. How much is being saved to the uttermost? Think about it. Get rid of your pride, whatever your issues are, and stop being, what about this verse? Forget about all those problem verses that everybody's arguing about. Have faith in the clear verses that um, should you should be able to understand. Anybody should be able to understand these verses. That, that's the key, Luke. What will happen is the false teacher will shake a babe in Christ and go, see, look at all these verses. They're about salvific loss. And they're not about salvation's loss at all. They're completely out of context every time. And so that's that's what we do. We try to help people understand, no, you you can trust in your Savior. Right. These can verses I, need to be understood. Can I, can I, Don't can I, throw out. Don't uh, throw answer, out uh, 20 clear verses for one vague one, you know? Uh, can I answer uh, this Jonathan Edwards question? I'm sorry, what, Luke? Jonathan Edwards just posted a question. I'd like to answer that. Sure, go ahead. Jonathan Edwards wrote, I got a question. What about, another what about is, huh? but what about the verse <laughs> where it says we have to be holy and be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect? Okay, Jonathan Edwards, are you holy and perfect? Jesus says you've got to be holy and perfect if you want to go to heaven through your own works. If you want to go to present your righteousness to God, it better be holy, it better be perfect from your first breath to your last breath, not one bad deed, not one bad thought, not even one failure to do good at every minute of the day. <laughs> Is that good, Jonathan Edwards? Jesus says if you're not that good, your works are like filthy rags in the sight of God. That's why you need Jesus. That's why Jesus said it, to convict you and show you your, your works are filthy rags and you are not deserving of heaven. You need a savior. And his name is Jesus Christ. I will give it. Let me give him this verse on how you're perfect. Brother uh, Jonathan, I'm going to tell you how you're perfect enough for heaven. All right. Let me let me go over to Hebrews here. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And we see over in Hebrews where it says that we are uh, sanctified by the offering of Jesus's body. Uh, so the way you are perfect is when God imputes his righteousness on you because you've trusted in what his son did. So he yeah. gives you God's righteousness. He no longer sees you and your failure. He sees his son's perfection in your place. That's why the Bible has these spiritual truths that are kind of hard to understand carnally. When it talks about being in Christ, if you are inside of Christ, it is Christ that represents you. It is Christ that God sees in your place, not you. So you're perfect and holy and God sanctified you. He made you holy. You're set apart. Let me see if there's a verse over here out of the ones you pulled up. Okay, uh, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified, that means set apart, by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. That's how he is addressing the saints. They are holy because God made them holy. He set them apart. Yeah. So um, if, you're, if you're worried about the without holiness, no man shall see the Lord, that's about people seeing the Lord in us. You know, be peaceable with all men and holiness, for without which no man shall see, no man shall see the Lord. He's not going to see God in us if we're not peaceable with them. So uh, you got to just read things in context. Nobody is holy and perfect because of how they live. Amen. And the Bible says that we have been completed in him. Yep. And how do we get in him? When we come humbly before the Lord and put our faith and trust in him alone, when we are born again of the Holy Spirit, there is a spiritual thing that takes place that only God can perform. And Ephesians 2 describes it as being quickened together with Christ by the Spirit of God. Yeah. yeah, we've been brought back to life. The spirit is quickened. It's brought to life in Christ. And, you know, a lot of times Jesus was talking to Israel about the standards being so high in the law because they he wanted them to change their mind. He wanted them to repent. He wanted them to change their mind about 
how good they are and how they're going to get to heaven. Many of them thought they were going to have eternal life because they were children of Abraham. Right. Yes, yes sister, preach it. Because, preach it. because they thought they were children of Abraham and they thought that they were strictly adhering to the letter of the law That's in right. which they were, but they had no realization of just how short of God's perfect standard they came. That's, That's right. why Jesus increased it and said, it's written in your law that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you even look upon a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. He yep. was trying to show them that without Christ's righteousness given to them, they should in no wise even enter into heaven. And and the cut off your hand if your hand offends in your eye. Well, what do you do about your heart? Can't walk around without a heart. See, he's got to transform you. It, it's... He's got to create you completely anew. The, the spirit has to be reborn. And one day we'll lose this flesh, this fallen flesh that fails. And he will give us a body that doesn't sin. And we're supposed to fight against this while we're here. We're not supposed to let the flesh rule us. We're supposed to let the spirit rule us. But these are instructions to his children, not to become his child, but after you're already his child, yes. faith. D-Roy in the comments just yeah. touched on something you were talking about the other night, Renee, about how people forget that due to carnality, due to immaturity, due to a, uh, you know, a distant fellowship and in a distant relationship with God, there are going to be some people in the kingdom of heaven that are called the least. Yeah, it, said, it says, uh, who's, I'll paraphrase it, but it says, whosoever breaks the least of these laws and tells other men to do it too, they'll be least in the kingdom. So if you break God's law and then encourage others to break his law, you'll be least in the kingdom. And another thing Jesus was pointing out in the Sermon on the Mount was that the way up in his kingdom is really down here on earth. And what do I mean by the way up and the way down? He's contrasting the difference between pride and humility, pride and meekness. Pride and sacrificial service. Jesus emphasizes a lot of um, basically, uh, you know, humbling ourselves. Yeah, he who abases himself shall be exalted, and he who exalts himself shall be abased. Yeah, you're absolutely Amen. Right. Go ahead, Brother Luke. Uh, uh, Brother Dave was talking earlier about Romans 10.3, and it's important for uh, Jonathan Edwards again about have to be holy and uh, righteous and the obviously you can't present your own righteousness to God because it's not good enough and and uh, as Renee said the righteousness of Christ imputed to the believer is what God accepts but in Romans 10:3 it explains the problem and it says there are people who are attempting to establish their own righteousness and they want to present that to God but it goes on to say, but that's not God's way. God's not going to deal with you the way the world thinks. Oh, I got to All I got to do is be good enough and present it to God. And, if, you know, hopefully it's good enough and he'll accept me. Romans mm -hmm. 10, 3 says people are trying to do that, but that's not God's way. God's way is for the righteousness of Jesus Christ to be credited to you through faith. That's the only way. So if you do want to be uh, considered righteous, declared holy by God, sanctified. That means you're set apart, declared holy. Uh, if you want that, it's only accomplished by faith in Jesus. Then it's like Jesus comes and puts his robe of righteousness on you. And like when they're looking around to let people in to the, to the, the banquet, the wedding banquet, the people who didn't have that uh, wedding garment on, they weren't allowed in. That's, that's a picture of the people who are covered with the righteousness of Christ. Amen. If you try to go there without that, just on your own, you're going to be told to hit, <laughs> hit the road. Amen. Hey, uh, brother. Right away into that lake over there. See that lake burning? <laughs> go on there. <laughs> Jonathan, the one that was asking the question earlier, he said, final call 07, and Robert Light worried him. I, I'm going to say this as clear as I can. Final call 07 is an unsaved, Heretic. heretic heretic 
And Robert, 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 whatever his name is, he's just as bad. These are the people who Jesus warned us of yes. who are making children twice the children of hell. Blatant work salvationist, denies the Bible is the word of God, has zero understanding of scripture, denies the gospel. He is an enemy of the cross and you need to stop listening to him. Look, just because somebody says the name of Jesus doesn't mean they're his. He said many will come in my name and say I am Christ and deceive many. So they're going to admit he's Christ and they're going to deceive many. You cannot listen to anyone that denies the Bible is God's preserved written word. He said he's, it's not the word of God because Jesus is the word. Jesus is the living word and the Bible. And the word made flesh and the word was God. And the word became flesh. So, uh, you know, you, you need to really get your spirit ears open before you listen to somebody like that. He is any saved person like had any that you can tell. Just watch five minutes and you should be able to know. See here, here, watch Sister Renee, now. here's how they can discern the, the little subtle twist of Satan. Robert Light and, and, and Final Call, yeah, they preach on holiness and fighting sin and, and, and being like Christ or Christ-like. They preach on things that, that contain some truth, mm -hmm. but they deny the scriptural truth behind those truths. That's and they right. say, no, you won't be saved unless you do this, this, and this. Having you a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, so don't listen to them anymore. You're going to be very... Look, I'm not right on everything at all. I try to stick to soteriology. That's what I know. And I have difference of opinions on other things. But I am a sister in Christ, and I know salvation. And uh, that that they are absolutely false teachers. There's no way. Uh, I, I can't say for sure somebody's not saved, but come on, anybody that denies the scriptures, God's preserved word, and then tells you it's idolatry to read the Bible, and then tells you that it's not the cross Jesus died on, it's the cross you carry that gets you to heaven. Uh, I'd say they're pretty satanic. Okay, I'd like to... Make a speech for a second here. Go right ahead, bro. Get him, brother Luke. You you talked about you cannot uh, declare someone saved or judge whether someone's saved or not. And you know, um, in our congregation, there's always a lot of conversations going on, uh, judging about whether they think someone's saved or not. Particularly on the on the question of not so much in, in our community about oh, does their life measure up? Uh, we we I think we're all in agreement that. We're not going to judge someone's salvation by how spiritually mature they are. Uh, but, w but when it comes to our faith, uh, th there's questions about this. And, and now considering uh, these people you're refer referencing, I don't remember their names, but uh, whether it's them or anybody else, the, I believe the protocol that we should all be following is let's not talk about anything anybody's done in the past. They say, well, they say they, they um, um, believe 20 years ago. 20 years ago, they became a believer, and then they went into lordship, and then they went into this, and then they went into this. And, uh, or let's say, let's say at some point in time, they went forward to the altar. Or they, they, at some point, they called on the name of the Lord, or they said it's a sinner's prayer, or whatever they, they associate with, well, that's when I became a believer. Let's not talk about that because I don't care about that. I can't prove any of that. I don't know what happened in the past. The only thing that's safe for us to do right now is ask them right now, are you certain you're going to go to heaven? Are you certain you have eternal life? And if you are certain, based on what? Why? And I don't, who cares? If they prayed or didn't or went forward or didn't or called on the Lord or didn't, I don't care what happened. All I want to know is right now, do you believe, are you certain, are you confident you're going to go to heaven because of what Jesus did for you and his promise of eternal life? If you cannot say I'm confident, it's guaranteed to me uh, by Jesus, then you don't understand and believe the gospel right now. Did you in the past? Who knows? I can't, I can't know that. No one can know that. And Brother Luke, if they're denying the gospel, we shouldn't listen to them, whether we're saved or not. We, if they're denying it now, we shouldn't listen to anything. If they're denying it now, they are an unbeliever. 
Now, there's a question. Can you be an unbeliever and then later on, uh, I mean, can you be a believer and then later on be an unbeliever that got saved in the past? I don't even care about that. All I care about is this. Are you a believer right now? If you do not, if you do not understand and declare, I'm going to heaven. It's settled. It's guaranteed. Why? Because of Jesus shed blood for me and his promise of eternal life. And if you cannot say that, when believe that with confidence, you're not a believer. Now, there is a problem if you're not a believer now. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I think that's the best way to look at it. If a person is teaching on here and they're denying the finished work of the cross and mixing discipleship with that, you just can't look. Look, people need to be called to preach. And, and, and there's many that are not. And I, I don't know why they're on here doing it, to be honest. It took me a long time to come on. I wanted to be really sure about salvation and be sure that God wanted to use me because I know there's a greater condemnation. Be not many masters, it says. You know, we're all supposed to preach the gospel, but there are far too many false teachers on here. I wanted to answer one of the gentlemen uh, in the chat room said something about bad tree and good fruit sir that verse in matthew is specifically a, a shot in the head to the pharisees the legalists that didn't believe on jesus and it's a warning of false prophets it's not about a believer not living good enough so you'll know them by their fruit it's talking about false prophets and the words they speak is it is it in accord with god's word or not that's the fruit you're looking for because a false prophet can't produce a real convert. That's other fruit. False converts come from false prophets. Let's look at the verses real quick, you guys. Uh, Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets. It tells you right there what it's about. Which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruit. Know who? False prophets. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot produce good fruit. All that's saying is you got to be in Christ. He does the same thing with the parable of uh, the vineyard. You can't even do anything good until you're in Christ. It's not possible. You have to be in Christ to produce anything good. And these false prophets are not in Christ. It has nothing to do with a true believer that isn't, you know, their fruit is their lifestyle. That's not what it's talking about at all. So I'm sorry. I just, I wanted to answer that for him. Yeah. But my question to him and all others, it goes back to this. Okay. Are, 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 what, what about ism again? What about ism? Were you going like this? All the verses that we're showing you that are clearly saying you're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, and you have eternal security, that's your result, and you jump them for joy because of this blessed assurance of your salvation, and yet you cover your ears, you cannot hear this, you refuse to listen to this. What is wrong with your heart that you want to not have ears for that, but you want What about this? What about that? Brother and Luke, we got what? Bray Bray Gwittish or something. He's made quite a few videos against me. He's in the channel in the chat room. He said, Does my gospel heal the broken? What hey Bray, hey Bray, let me say something to you, Bray. Uh you have uh you have uh the audacity to go and make videos against a a, a, a child of God who is proclaiming the, the sufficiency of the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ. Let me say something to you, Mr. Bray. Uh, you need to tread lightly. It is very dangerous to speak ill of those who trust and serve the Lord. Not every one of us is completely accurate or perfect in all things. But I can guarantee you, as a child of God myself for many years... This sister is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The same gospel that got Paul the Apostle persecuted by many, many people, including the Judaizers. You, sir, better tread lightly on the videos that you make, making accusations and claims against sons and daughters of God, lest the Lord rebuke you himself, and you come under divine discipline of his hand. You better watch how you put your mouth on the children of God, sir. 
the the question was does my god it's not my gospel it's the gospel of the grace of god or the gospel of christ it's the same gospel uh, Paul preached. Uh, Renee, Renee, this is your channel. You deal with it how you want. If this, if this is my channel, this guy Bray would be gone because this, he's in here to trying to uh, uh, harm the, the congregation. He's trying to uh, uh, teach people the damnable heresy. I would not permit it, but that's it's up to you. You guys say. got wrenches in there if anything's offensive, but I want to ask him. He asked me, does the gospel heal the broken? The sufficiency of God coming in the flesh, dying for your sins, if that doesn't heal you, it gives you, it doesn't just heal you, it gives you a whole reborn spirit. And if you believed the true gospel and believed that you had eternal life that you could never lose because it's eternal and, and Christ revealed to you the truth of what he's done for you and how sufficient that is. And how we got nothing to offer in regards to salvation, then you would know if it heals the broken because you'd be healed. Oh my goodness. If he oh sister, he said that he listens to the Holy Spirit. Well, if he was listening to the Holy Spirit, then he would be able to discern with his spiritual eyes that there are numerous people who God has led to your channel. Who have come to the truth and it began to blossom and it began to grow and began to come into the truth of the word of God. And it has made a very significant impact and change in their life. They've come out of legalism. They've come out of false doctrines. They've come out of false gospels. God has led them to your channel. They have received the pure gospel of Christ. They have put their trust in it and they've been with you for a long time and they are flourishing. They are growing. They are gaining understanding. That is the fruit that is being birthed from the ministry that God has given you. And anybody who comes against that is not listening to the Holy Spirit. There, there's no way you can be listening to the old uh, He would bear witness. Renee, you've, known me for a long, you've known me for a long time. You know, whenever I've done any programs, uh, I do not engage in, in this kind of thing. I, I, I only have believers participating, and I don't entertain the, uh, this kind of heretic in, in, the, in the community. Uh, uh, I, look what's happened already. Look what the result of this person being here has done. This is degraded. <laughs> For me, being a Bible study and a teaching on this, this doctrine, it's degraded. And uh, I, I don't want to be part of it. So. Hey, Hendrix, you got that taken care of, sweetheart? He, he, he called me a narcissist probably because I'm half deaf and I get passionate and I scream. But no, listen, all right. he hey, hey what, what did our Lord tell us to do? He said, cry aloud and spare not. Listen, Bray, buddy, if you were listening to the Holy Spirit, then you would know. That the Holy Spirit bears witness to the things of God, brings into remembrance the word of God, aligns with the word of God and the truth of God. Listen, the Holy Spirit is not our feelings, buddy. No. The Holy Spirit is not our opinions, buddy. The Holy Spirit will bring into remembrance the truth of God's word. For my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. That is the voice of the word of God. And this is and what I, we uh, preach. I did do one live stream a long time ago with him. And I was very kind to you and I've never responded to you in any ugly way. So let's just look at that for, and leave it at that. Okay. Um, brother Luke, I had a list of stuff here on our eternal security. Let me see. Um, you know, I've had some people come around brother Luke that are adamantly against the truth and they come back later and they're really glad because they finally, come to the end of themselves. The law makes them guilty and somehow through the miracle of God, he gives them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth of the real gospel. And I always keep that hope out for people, but there are some that are more um, ugly about it than others. But I wanted to look at some truths about God's promises. Okay. I'm going to just list them real quick and then we can all go through verses that support them if you'd like. Uh, number one, the believer has, like Brother Luke had pointed out, everlasting or eternal life. We, we have it now. Second, the believer is born of God. They are born again into the family of God. Number three, Christ will raise every believer up at the last day. That's a promise. Number four, the believer has already passed from death to life. Brother Luke gave you that verse earlier. Number five, the believer is not the object of God's wrath. Number six, the believer 
are God's sheep. Number seven, the believer will not listen to nor follow a stranger, but will flee from him. Okay, we got to we've got to know this one as a person that's been convinced by God of the truth in Christ. They shouldn't be going after a false teacher. Uh, anybody tells you any other way to salvation and should ring uh, very false to you. Um, and that, that'd be concerning to me if it wasn't. Uh, the believer is in Christ's hands. And not only that, we're also in the Father's hands. So like this, Brother Luke likes to tell us. Jesus and the Father, double whammy. Um, and we cannot be plucked out. Number 11, the believer is in the Father's hand and can't be plucked out. 12, the shepherd is charged with the responsibility of keeping the sheep. Whose responsibility? It's God himself that keeps us, like Peter tells us, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Number 13, the believer is not condemned. Number 14, the believer shall never thirst. 15, the believer will keep Christ's commandments. What's that? To believe on him and love one another. 17, the believer shall never die. 18, the believer is kept from the evil. 19, the believer is to be with Christ in glory. And number 20, the believer shall never hunger. I have another 15, but that's plenty right there to start with. We could go on for a week on eternal security. Um, but the first one, Brother Luke, I'm going to start there and see what y'all have to say about that. The first point we have here uh, is for our uh, blessed assurance is the believer already has everlasting or eternal life. I'm sure you guys have verses on that. We have that. John 5, 24, you've already read it, Brother Luke. I'll read it again. Verily, verily, that's truly, truly, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. See, we're believing on God to save us. We're believing what he said about Jesus. That he came and died for our sins. And because he died and rose again for our justification, meaning we're declared righteous in the sight of God, we have eternal life. It says, half everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John 10, 28, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So there's some proof verses that we have eternal life. Now, I know you guys must have some more. Or comments on it, or whatever. You know, there's there's a lot more. I, I, I've got the the coup de gras, my favorite. I'm saving until the very end. Nobody, okay. Nobody's mentioned it yet. I hope uh, I, I hope I get to. You, well, I hope I hope, brother Luke, that it's not John six. No, uh, I, 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 it's a climax for the show. I think. Awesome. I'm awesome. going to let's say uh, I, I want to mention this um, Romans eleven twenty nine. Um, uh, it says. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And a modern translation says, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Okay, that means that it's irrevocable, it's irreversible, it can't be undone, it, you can't go back to your previous state. Uh, uh, the gifts. So what are the gifts? The Bible tells us that at the moment of our belief, we get five gifts from God. You get the gift of grace, the, the gift of righteousness, the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. All of this is without repentance. Now, that means that God will not change his mind and take back his gifts. So that should make everybody uh, understand that uh, you, this is eternal security. Uh, it, it, you can't lose it because it's irrevocable. It cannot be undone, just as like you cannot go back upside your mother's womb and undo your birth. Uh, bro I left Brother Dave, I left Dave speechless. Huh? You're all speechless. I was, wait, I was waiting to see if Brother Dave wanted to add to that. Oh, Brother. absolutely. I want to. I want to just break this down so people in the chat can understand. John chapter 6, verses uh, 36 through 40. Now, I want to carefully explain this so people understand that we are not saying, oh, we have eternal security because we think so. Oh, we have eternal security because it sounds so great. Oh, we have eternal security because we have to believe that in order to 
whatever. We're not this. We believe in eternal security because it was taught from Jesus Christ himself. Let me explain. John chapter 6, verses 36 through 40. I'm going to read them, and then I want to talk to you about something to help you understand. It says, But I said unto you that you also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father give me shall come to me, and they that come to me I will in no wise, in other words, under any circumstances, for any reason, in no wise cast them out. Look at what Jesus said. This is what many people overlook. They read these verses, but they don't catch the key understanding. And here it is. Jesus says, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So do we as Christians all believe that Jesus Christ perfectly obeyed the will of his father? The answer should be yes. Of course. So verse 39 says, and this is the father's will who sent me that all of which he has given me i shall lose nothing but shall raise them up again okay jesus said that he came down from heaven to do the will of his father jesus has perfectly followed his father's will jesus illustrates the will of his father that all who he gives to christ christ will lose none not some None. Jesus Christ has a perfect saving record. And look what it says. Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who seeth the Son and believeth on him hath everlasting life, and I will raise them up on the last day. So it's not dependent upon us, our faith in Christ. It, it, we, we have to put our faith in Christ. Yes. But the fact that Christ loses none is the Father's will in which Christ fulfills perfectly. If Jesus was lying, the verse would have to say, I lose none, but some lose themselves. But this is not taught in Scripture. It is taught in Scripture that all that the Father give to the Son the son will prefer, perfectly complete the father's will and lose none, and he will raise them up again on the last day for all who put their faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone. Amen. And uh, the second point, Brother Luke, we've, we've talked about this mostly, but I wanted to see if you were wanted to add anything more to it. The second part of our eternal security is that we're born of God. And I, I just have one verse pulled up on that. Uh, John 1 12 but as many as received him received him yes him gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God so it is not our will it's not anything we are doing to be born it's receiving Christ. It's it's saying, I need my Savior. I need his blood. I need what he's done for me. And receiving that, putting your faith in what he's done for you, makes you born of God. We were talking earlier about uh, how Brother Luke was talking about the uh, thing with Nicodemus. You must be born again. And the uh, bronze serpent with Moses in the wilderness. You know, it's the same thing. It's an event. So I don't know if you guys wanted to add anything to that. Um, well, that's perfect, sis, because I was just about to say about the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Let's let the Bible tell us what God has told us. Okay, we know that those who believe on Jesus Christ and are born again receive his Holy Spirit. What happens when that when we receive it? Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, that sealing of the Holy Spirit, the Bible defines as a definite period of time. What do I mean? In Ephesians 4.30, the Bible tells us that the believer is sealed for a definite period of time, which is the day of redemption or the resurrection of the body. Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you have been sealed 
until the day of redemption. I'm going to tell you now, folks, I don't know it all, but I've been studying this word for about 10 years. I've searched high and low, Old Testament, New Testament. I've searched all types of, I've searched the Bible high and low, and I've looked for a scripture that in any way would indicate that a sealed born-again believer could become unsealed prior to the day of redemption. And I have not found it anywhere. It's so when probably. God says, when God says, when you've been sealed with this Holy Spirit, it's for a definite period of time. And that time stated in scripture is until the day of redemption or unto the resurrection of our bodies and not a day prior. Brother Luke, Brother Dave, I have literally had people try to tell me we can break that seal. <laughs> I've been Whatever. asking for I've been asking for a chapter and verse on the yeah. breaking of the seal for yeah. about ten years, and I and I have yet to have anybody Air provide it. Nothing. They try. You know where they go? They say, "We're Holy Spirit, take not your Holy Spirit from me." Well, they do. They bring up the Old Testament because they yeah, don't the understand. Testament. That's right. the Old they, Testament, and and David wasn't saying he lost his salvation. He wanted the joy of his salvation back. Rest so, restoration yeah. of the joy. Correct. Yeah. And another very key point, a very key point that people don't understand is that prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, God would allow the Holy Spirit to fall upon men and women as he willed. There was not necessarily a sealing, and that sealing did not come into, into effect until Christ said he must return unto the Father and send unto us the Comforter. Right. There in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came and went as God willed. Yep. And in the New Testament, once God marks you and purchases you and seals you as a possession of his, you are sealed until the day of redemption. There is a difference between the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant and the New. Yep, you got it. I'm glad you uh, mentioned that. Well, these... Um I posted that verse. I was going to talk about it. Uh, Ephesians four thirty of this being sealed, and the uh, uh, to me that relates to the first verses we were talking about tonight when it was talked about preserved. It says uh, uh, the servant uh, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. So we're preserved in Jesus Christ, and it says we're, whole, we're, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Um, these are pretty good illustrations of something that's permanent and you're safe. It's not, nothing's going to change. Like uh, Curtis Hudson talked about how you preserve a jar of peaches, you know, and you, and you put them in there, and they, they don't change. They're, they're, they're preserved in that state, and uh, the, 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 thing is, the jar is shut, and then it's sealed with wax around the end until it's time to open it. And uh, that that seems to me that uh, this nothing can undo that until um, God takes us in, into the resurrection or, or our death. But the uh, uh, when people want to say that, well, you could be unsealed, you can unseal yourself or something, this person has an evil heart and they are desperate to reject the gospel. Uh, also, you wanted uh, you you mentioned the verse Renee, and you said uh, believe in His name. Uh, that's the part of the verse that stood out to me. Believe yeah. in the name of Jesus. Uh, people don't, many don't understand the significance of believing in His name. That is the gospel. They, so, they think it means how you pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. when you say Yeshua, uh, it literally trans to Yah means God, and Shua means saves. God saves. Um, so Jesus' name, meaning God saves, is Jesus is God who saves. And this is the, what we need to come to, that's really the gospel in a nutshell. We need to come to the conclusion that we don't save ourselves it, we need Jesus to do the saving. We need to rely on God, Jesus to save us. So uh, faith in his name, believing in his name, is really another way of saying believe in the gospel. Believe in, in Jesus to be the Savior. Believing God is our salvation. Because salvation is of the Lord. It is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
I wish Brother John this, if it's Sister Renee, I, I don't know what Jonathan happened to Jonathan, but I just did a, I just literally preached an hour long video on these lying spirits and these and these false light of Lucifer earlier today. Jonathan Edwards claims that he had a spiritual awakening. I believe, uh, you know, and he's saying that he's seeing numbers and he's he's seeing certain things and, and getting uh, certain visions. And I believe that these visions are coming from lying spirits. Be careful with that kind of stuff. Every time you have a supernatural experience, you better test the spirits. Now, if you're already trusting only what Christ has done, the Holy Spirit's revealed to you your blessed assurance and how it's all about what Christ has uh, suffered on the cross and his resurrection alone for salvation, then maybe you could, I could be, you know, you're probably hearing from him, but let's test the spirits anyway. But if you're not, I, I would be very careful of, of if you don't even have the basic milk of God's word, why would he give you extra revelation when he's given you a book, this thick that gives you so much revelation? There's no real need for extra revelation there. Not saying he can't do it, but always be very careful. You don't want, see, Satan comes as an angel of light. Yes, to deceive. ministers as ministers of righteousness. So you've okay. got to be very careful believing that stuff. Just, uh, I just posted some verses here. This entire program, really, we could talk for two hours just about this, uh, these four verses, three, four, and five of First Peter chapter three. Oh, yep. yeah. Absolutely. Let, me, let me read this. And then, sister, what did you teach on here? It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last. <clears throat> yeah, that that's why I started it. Uh, the whole show with that because you can't you can't refute that, brother Luke. That's so. Did you start with it? I don't remember you started with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, We've been talking for a while. I forgot where we. But were. I didn't. I didn't read. I didn't read three. I just read four and five. But you're you're you were right to put that there. And I'm going to even go one verse above elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the father. If God foreknows you, you are his. Why would he foreknow somebody? He's not going to, that's not going to be his. It doesn't even make sense through sanctification of the spirit, meaning the Holy spirit. You're holy because you have the spirit. You're holy because you have the Holy spirit sanctification of the spirit, the spirit within the seat of Christ. He cannot sin obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus obedience of what obedience of the gospel believing the truth about uh salvation that comes only through Jesus grace unto you and peace be multiplied this is where brother Luke started blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again that's good that means born again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead how, why do we have such a lively hope? By the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. People act like it, somebody rising from the dead is no big deal. So that's not enough. That's crazy. They, I mean, this was unheard of, you know? Well, people also have to realize that Peter does go on to say that when we are begotten of God, or in other words, when we receive the Holy Spirit or we are born again, Peter clarifies and he declares that we are born of incorruptible seed, Incorru which, right. which liveth and abideth That's right. forever. That's right. And to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. And then we, who, who he's writing to, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. That's us. Us. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And so what does he do? He's starting out the letter by encouraging the saints based on the hope that's set before them. We're kept by God's power. It's not us. Anybody that thinks it has something to do with their performance and faithfulness, 
does not understand that salvation is completely of God. It is not of us at all. I want to carefully read just a few verses real quick. Really? And hopefully people in the chat that are struggling will hear the words of God. Um, and, and, and hopefully they, they get received in their, in their hearts because this is a very powerful truth. Now pay attention. See, when people read the Bible, they tend to read really quickly or skip over some what they seem to, to think are very uh, uh, minor things or insignificant words. But the wording of the scripture is so powerful. And I want to read just a short three verses here in Romans 5. I'm going to read verses 8 through 10. And I want the chat to listen. It says, but God, but God, not us, commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So do you see that the love and the desire to save us originated with God and his mercy, his love and his kindness toward us that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. Why? Because only Jesus Christ was capable of fulfilling every standard of God in order for God to justly atone for sin. And so verse 9 says, much more than being now justified by his blood. Again, no merit or effort on our own, but justified by his blood. We shall be saved from God's wrath through the life of Christ. And it says in verse 10, for if when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled, which means to be restored or made anew, we shall be saved by Christ's life. It is the obedience of Christ, the blood of Christ, the fulfilling of God's will by Christ. It is the life of Christ literally given to us. And Colossians chapter 3 says that we have been hidden. Our lives are, have been hidden in Christ. Yeah, that is a, it's a promise. It's just, it's just sad because when people deny our eternal security, they deny God's promises. Um, yeah, and I, and they get it, you know, it's the, it's the mix up, sis. It's the mix up from salvation, which is a gift, which is based on Christ and your trust in him versus your life and service or ongoing, you know, sanctification. Right. Uh, even though spiritually we're sanctified in Christ right. once and for all, an experiential process of sanctification. I right. They 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 combined they combined the the salvation with the life and service unto God, and they make each one dependent upon each other, and that's not true. Right. Well, and that's well, where a lot of the confusion comes, because they say, oh, because we preach eternal security. Then, then we must we must be preaching that everybody go out and live wicked, sinful right. lives. That's not what we preach. That. Yeah, they don't get it. Because, I mean, we know that to be under God's chastisement is no fun. Um, and we we have to look our Lord in the eye and tell him what we did with the gift he gave us. You know, I, I don't want to be ashamed. But uh, Right. And, and as a preacher of the gospel, as, as a minister of God's word and one who God is put in position to care for and exhort and, and, and admonish and nurture people that are growing in Christ. How could I stand before God and say, God, I told everybody just do as they please live wickedly. Listen, right. salvation is not based on how good you live or how well you climb the ladder of spiritual maturity. Some are going to go on to maturity much more than others. Some are going to have more rewards than others. Some are going to uh, receive uh, different types of responsibilities than others because of the way that they grew in maturity. But all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and for people to accuse us who preach the free grace of God and the eternal security of God, for them to accuse us of, of teaching a, a wicked, sinful living is just a lie of the enemy. Because yeah. even this is the difference between us and them. We know that we fail God. We know that we need the grace of God. We know that there's forgiveness in our failures, but we continue to get back up in faith and we continue to press on towards the mark and high calling of Christ. These people feel like they've already arrived. 
they feel like because they've eliminated certain sins out of their life that they right. can just turn around and hold out some holy measuring stick and anybody who doesn't come close to where they feel they're at they condemn them and right. say that they're you know they're wicked and they're sinful and they're not of god and that's that's the epitome of self righteousness and and that is what god is is that's an abomination to god and if you read the parable of the tax collector god's word will clearly refute that attitude right and, and you know the salvation is just the beginning. It's just the beginning of a Christian's life. But until they get that beginning, until they get that foundation, none of the other stuff matters. That's right. They can everything they do in their service to God, their prayers, their church, their it's their good deeds, their giving. Anything. It'll all yes. be done if it will all be done in vain. Yes. Less less they come to and through Christ alone. Right. They got to trust Christ alone and then go on to do all these. They think they're serving God and it's God doing. No, it's not. They If they haven't trusted only what Christ did, they haven't even done the first thing he asked. And that's they, believe on him. And they, that's why, and that's why many will come to him on that day and say, Lord, Lord, I God. did. I preached in your name. I cast out devils in your name. Yep. I did all types of good deeds and mighty works in your name. And he says, I never knew you. He doesn't say, he doesn't say, I used to know you, but you screwed up too much. Right. He says, I never knew you. Yep. You never because they, they, they never bypassed, they bypassed the cross and the spiritual rebirth altogether. And there's a famous saying, there's a famous saying, there's going to be plenty of righteous religious people who are cast into hell one day while many publicans and harlots and prostitutes yep. who have repented and put their faith on Christ alone will enter into glory. Yep. That's why he said, yeah, the harlots and the publicans will enter heaven before you do. Because you believe not. Yep. That's right. Um, one of the promises for every person that's trusting in Christ. And, and again, to believe on or to believe in, it's not like Brother Luke said, just believing some information about him. It's it's trusting that God gave us salvation through what Christ has done and that it is a free gift. And that's the only way there. And one of those promises is to raise us up. I, I pulled that verse up. John 6, 44. He will raise every person that's trusting him up. Uh, no, per no man can come unto me except the father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that has <laughs> heard and has learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man has seen the Father, save which he is of God. He has seen the Father. There's your Jesus is not the same person as the Father. Hey, sis, you know, you know how the Bible says. Let me finish the verse. Go ahead, sir. Verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life period go ahead brother Dave. you know the bible says that we should never uh you know glorify ourselves but but if anybody is to speak well of us let let others speak well of us and i just want to testify right now about a half hour ago when the guy was accusing you uh, of not hearing from the holy spirit or not preaching the truth whatever whatever didn't I defend you? And I said that people who have uh, our ch children of God that have the spirit and have discernment can verify that there is good fruit coming out of out of your gospel and your teachings that God has, has given you uh, to, you know, to preach to people. Didn't I say that? Yes, sir, you did. Now, now watch this. Here is how the Holy Spirit works. There is validation in what I said to you and what many people already know about you. Because the sister Lee Jen said, wow, I really feel like I was led here tonight. I have the gift of discernment, but there's so much confusion uh, being taught. But this is really ringing true to me. I'm so thankful God led me here tonight. Well, praise God. Thank you. Is it, is it Lee Jen, you said? Yes. Thank you for coming. You're welcome here anytime. Thank you, you so much. And you see, when people come to accuse, Satan is the accuser of the brethren, okay? None of us none of us are saying that, hey, we've arrived. 
you know, we're so great because we stopped this sin or we stopped that sin. Yeah, we all got certain sins we wrestle with. We all got sins we struggle with. We're all in the same race, but we're not in the same place. And my spirit bears witness to Sister Renee and Brother Luke can back me up and tons of people in the chat can back me up because there's actual living water coming out of this ministry. There's actual fruit growing from this ministry. And the Bible says, a good tree bringeth forth good fruit. A bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit. So therefore, when the person accused Sister Renee, I had to defend her, and I'm glad that I got to defend her because then God now comes behind us and verifies that defense by a sister admitting that this is ringing true to her and that she even has the sermon and, and amidst all the confusion, she's thanking God that she was led here tonight. Now you tell me that's not a work or a move of God. You can't convince me otherwise. That That's amazing. And I, I honestly try to continue to be kind, even to those that, you know, say ugly things about me. I, I fear a lot of them are just misunderstand what I say. A lot of people have just watched videos that others have done against me and never even bothered to check to see what I really say. Uh, and I hope that some people will hear that. And I try to be uh, kind even when they're not kind to me. But um there's something cute in here. This gentleman said, Scott said something about God's not a lottery God. He's not going to just like, uh, let me see how he, how he worded it. God is not a lottery God. He foresaw those who would love and ensured that we would be his in his kingdom. Yes, he did. According to the foreknowledge of God, the father, it says that he foreknew us. So he's not going to foreknow us and call us and give us to Jesus so that we can be lost. That's right. It's Jesus even said, I lose none. He didn't That's say right. I lose some. Right. He didn't say he didn't say some lose themselves. Now, if it were if it were actually true that we could pluck ourselves out of God's hand once he's given us the rebirth, then we know that God is a God who cannot lie. It's against his holy nature right. to even tell a lie. Jesus would not say I lose none. I Jesus will would lose nothing. That's right. Nothing. Yep. Jesus, Jesus would have to be honest with us and he would tell us, I lose nothing, but some lose themselves. But he did not say that. He also does the father's will all the time. And the father's will is that he'll lose nothing, but raise it up at the last day. And Jesus always does the father's will. It's not possible that he won't do it. Sis, Renee, can you imagine when I get out there to Vegas and I get up there with Brother Luke and we, we get out there and we get to preaching on the street? I can't wait. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be great. Um, the other promise is that, and Brother Luke was given this verse earlier, we have already passed from death to life. It, it's not, we can't go from death to life to death again. Or you could just read uh, Jude 24, sis. Jude 24 tells us yeah. that it's Christ who presents us faultless before oh, God in his glory. Yeah. Go ahead, read it, read it. You got it up? No, I don't have it up. I thought you might have. <laughs> no, no, I was just going to say, we've already passed from death to life. John 5, 24, Brother Luke read it earlier. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. We're not the God uh, under God's wrath either. It says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So if somebody denies that they have eternal life in Christ, do they have a son? Mm. I don't think so. They're not believing him. They don't believe him. No, they don't believe the record. They're not, they make God they're not a liar. In the gospel. And the way you're saved is, is to believe on Jesus. If you're not believing or if you're not trusting or relying on him alone for your salvation. Now, I'm not talking to these people that go, oh, it's God doing it in me. And all. they're mixing up the whole walk with salvation. I'm talking about trusting him completely, regardless of what you do. This is everybody should live a good, holy, godly life and get better and better and better and grow in grace and all that. We all agree with that. That's very important. We're talking just about salvation. If you don't believe that his death, burial, and resurrection gave you eternal life, when you trust in him, you've received him, you're born into God's family, you shall never perish, you shall not come into condemnation, you're justified of all things, perfected forever, you haven't believed the gospel. 
you haven't believed on Christ and you don't have life. And that's why you don't have the record of the truth. Oh. Witnessing. Sister, you hit the nail on the head. And here's the verse that's going to bring home and validate what you said about them not having the understanding. Right there in the very same chapter, 1 John chapter 5, about God giving us the record. And those who make God a liar by not believing the record. In verse 20, it tells us the understanding that we should have. It says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. This is the understanding that the Holy Spirit gives us as That's children of God. Right. That's right. And, and John says that we can know that we have eternal life and have it now. And it's eternal. So that, that, that should be what we all know. This is like Brother Luke says, you, you got to know that. If, if you don't know that, you don't understand the gospel. You haven't believed it. Brother Luke, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. Well, Paging I, Brother I, Luke. I got a couple of things I want to say. Uh, first of all, if a person does not understand uh, uh, and believe in eternal security, then they don't understand and believe the gospel because eternal security is the gospel. It's not good news if you're on probation. As I said in the very beginning, if you believe and you get put on probation, but anytime you misbehave, you lose your salvation. That's like teeter totter salvation. I'm saved, I'm lost, I'm saved, I'm lost. You know, that's Roman Catholicism of a series of uh, confessions, communions, and sin, and then confessions and communions of sin. And you, you uh, but I also want to talk about a comment here. There's somebody who wrote, I'm going to mention his name because I'm, this guy Bray, he, I'm going to read one of his comments and, and there, I'll tell you what stands out to me in a comment like this. Maybe I'm more uh, aware or, or uh, uh, focusing on these things, but see what, what words stick out to you as I read this. But then I got before the Lord and I said for him to, take away my lust and give me love. I asked for the greatest kind of romantic love, basically. And you can read in my songs and see what I got. <laughs> All I heard was me, 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 and I, I, I. What I did not hear was, was I humbled myself before the Lord and I put my trust on him. Yeah. We read the first, we did a study on Wednesday. We started the uh, Wednesday Bible study on uh, First Corinthians, and Brother Cripps uh, noted that the first ten verses, every one of the first ten verses had Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, ten times, and then right after that, you, you saw the I forgot the next verse, but it, you see why he's saying that because it's not about us. We have to stop thinking uh, being self centered. Bray and anybody else that doesn't understand and believe in faith alone, in Christ alone, in eternal security. You're self-centered. And you gotta be, it's got to be Christ-centered. You gotta be a Christian, relying completely on Christ, depending on Christ, confidence in Christ, persuaded that Christ has done it. But religion is, they say the religion is do, 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 but Jesus says done. And that's what you don't understand. It's done. Um, I forgot what you guys were talking about that I was going to respond to uh, before that. But what, whatever you were saying, I was going to say something, but I forgot now. <sighs> well. Uh, the, that they don't, if you were talking about they don't understand the gospel. They Do they really? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, eternal security. People... Uh, I've heard some people, there are some people that uh, don't like our congregation and, and, and what we are teaching and, and what we as a whole believe, uh, these core doctrines, and that uh, eternal security is the gospel. Uh, they, they think that eternal security is something that can, comes later, that a person will gain eternal security if they, if they get some kind of a 
uh, assurance from, from the Lord or something. But or when they see evidence in their lifestyle or something. Yeah. You know. Uh, but uh, a person can really believe in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Uh, they could, you can ask them, do you, do you believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead on the third day? And they say, yes, I believe that. And then you say, well, are you certain you're going to go to heaven? And why? And, and you're going to find that most people will, even though they say they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that he died for their sins, they don't understand the consequence and the implications of it that, that makes the difference. They've got to understand that salvation is received because of what he's done for them and his promise. If they don't believe that, that they get salvation because of what he's done, uh, but their answer to the question is, uh, yes, I believe he died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead, but I, no one can know for certain they're going to go to heaven, can they? I mean, I, I, I got my fingers crossed. I hope, I hope I'm going to heaven. And I hope I've been good enough. Uh, what would you say to God if he asked you, why should I let you into heaven? They say, well, I go to church and I follow the golden rule. I follow the commandments. I, 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 I pray. But if I, uh, if, if Renee or Brother David was asked, why should I let you into heaven? And they're going to plead the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid for my sins. He promised me eternal life. I rest my case. And we're not going to plead anything of our own merit. And a person, when a person understands this gospel, that they are guaranteed eternal life. And if you doesn't, if you don't understand that the, the gospel is the guarantee, it's the gift of eternal life. That means you don't work for it, earn it, or pay for it. Uh, and, and it's received as a free gift by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And it comes with a guarantee that he will never leave you or forsake you or take it back. It's irrevocable. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. It's irrevocable. That's the gospel. If you don't understand the gift and the guarantee, you don't understand and you don't believe the gospel. And you're not saved if you don't understand and believe that. Brother Luke, here's a here's a simple test that people can use to strengthen their foundation of their faith and the object of their faith. To train your spirit to keep your faith on Christ alone, you can do a very simple exercise. I'll ask the simple question. When you read John 6:47, what does it say? It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever believeth on me has everlasting life. That's what the scripture reads. When you read that scripture, do you automatically think, yes, I trust you, Jesus. I trust what you said. I'm believing on you. I know I have eternal life. I'm not going to doubt it. I'm not going to do anything but believe and trust that you said that if I believe on you, I have eternal life. That is a person who has come to a, a strong foundational faith in the sufficiency of Christ and his finished works alone. Now, other people read that verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever believeth on me has everlasting life. And they pause and they scratch their head and they say, but, but, but they're full of doubt, unsurety, no assurance. They, they need to get to a place where they can truly put their full trust on Christ. They're not there yet. They need to repent of their what about -ism. <laughs> Right. Or, or but, but, but -ism. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, if you do this, they're... what about that? But here's the thing. These questions wouldn't be answered if they believed the gospel because the eternal security is in the gospel because our foundation is based on Jesus and what he's already done. And his promise. His, his promise. Yeah, his promises. That's right. That's why I want everybody to get <laughs> that the reason you're secure and can know you're going to heaven no matter what you do. It's because you have passed from death to life. You're born into God's family. You're, you're kept by the power of God. You're sealed God. by the Holy Spirit. Right. You're sealed. You're kept by God. You're you're saved by God. You're drawn by God. It's all God, and salvation is of the Lord. It's based on Jesus' work, not your own. That's why you should have eternal security. Anyone trusting in Christ that understands the gospel should understand eternal security. 
because the foundation is based on Jesus and what's already been promised and done. Amen. And sis, I want to read a verse um, really quickly in, in Titus. Uh, you know, a lot of people, they, you know, they, they accuse us of, uh, you know, just telling people to live wickedly, blah, blah, blah. But here's the truth, okay? Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. It says, For the grace of God, that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, grace uh, gives us a desire to grow in maturity and the things that please God, Grace uh, also empowers us uh, uh, to get back up when we fail. And God knows if anybody's being honest, we fail God, if not every day, several times a day. And there's people out there that say, you don't have to sin every day. Look, you may not sin every day, but I guarantee you before the week's end, you have failed God in some area. It's the same grace of God that will pick you back up and cleanse you and, and dust you off that'll propel you forward with the desire to grow in the things of God. This is a lifelong process, and some do much better than others. So no way does any true gospel preacher preach that you should live a wicked, sinful life. We are only honest in that we need Jesus' righteousness, not our own. We are only honest that salvation is in the person and finished work of Christ alone. And we are only honest that we fail God much more than we would like to at times. But we remain faithful in the person and finished work of Christ. And therefore, God keeps us by his power. For God himself has promised, in whom I have started a good work in, I, God, is just and faithful to complete that work. You have to trust God. There's going to be seasons in our life where we stray from God. There's going to be seasons in our life where sin gets a hold of us. There's going to be seasons in our life where we where we grow to a place where we we start walking in the spirit more than the flesh. There's there's different seasons and trials in our life, but they're all meant to strengthen us, comfort us, and grow us in His grace. Yeah, and and it's true. We just we're nobody's promote. It's just silly for people to say that. But that's the attack that they get. They they say that you're of the devil. They say that I'm of the devil. They say that I'm a wolf, that I'm preaching a greasy grace I or never, easy believism. I have never met more compassionate, caring, giving, helping people than those that trust in, in well, I just say save people because I, I can't be for sure if the other ones are saved because they deny the gospel now. So I don't know if they ever were, but people that trust only in Christ, they're, they they are the the I mean they're the greatest I haven't seen any uh any of this in lordship people no kindness no compassion just judgment of others and you know it's just it, lordship can only do you know make you insecure and scared or it'll make you self righteous and a fruit inspector but the thing is is their their security rests on how much evidence they see in their own life yes but that no, it's, our security is based on God's promise, his word. He can't lie. He said if you trust in what he did, then he's provided the perfect uh, salvation for you in a person. One of my viewers said it's not the plan of salvation. It's the man of salvation in whom we trusted. We were sealed because we trusted in Christ to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And that's what uh, we do. Um, I was going to say the other uh, promise besides uh, already having passed from death to life is that we're not under God's wrath. God's wrath comes on anyone that's not in Christ. And that will be at the judgment seat, the great white throne judgment. The wrath of God abides on him. Let me get um, the verse here. One of them anyway. There's uh, many uh, John 3, 36. 
He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Well, they're not going to see life. The wrath of God abides on them. They're condemned already because they haven't believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so the wrath is not on us. Why? Because it was poured on Christ for us. And when we're in him, he's already paid the debt I owe. He's already paid the debt Luke owes. He's paid the debt Brother Dave is at owed. How, we can't pay it again. The wrath isn't on us. Christ already took the wrath of God for all who believe in him. And that's that's I another to, thing. Another I problem. Need, we're also, not being the wrath. Also, to, uh, if you believe, well, if you believe in worship, that means that you believe Jesus Christ did all that just for himself. That means you also have to die on the cross and do that painful process. Yeah, it wasn't enough. You. Yeah, he's just saying they're saying that what he did is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to make some final remarks here. Yeah, go ahead, brother Luke. Yeah, because hey, I, brother I, Luke, before before you do your final remarks, if you could pull up Second Corinthians five twenty one and read that for us, brother Luke. Okay. Just, just expound a little bit on 2 Corinthians 5.21. Okay. It says, uh, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness righteousness of God in him so this is uh, this is the what's called the great transaction yes the idea that the uh, the sin of humanity was put on Jesus Christ and that's just not Renee's and Dave's and mine and you you the congregation the Bible says he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the whole world, every person who's ever lived and ever will live, all that sin was put on Jesus Christ. It said he became sin for us. And uh, for those of us who believe, the righteousness of Christ is put on us. That's the robe of righteousness that I mentioned earlier that gets you into the wedding feast, uh, the wedding banquet, without that, that uh garment uh, you're not going to get in that's the righteousness of christ so we get his righteousness credit to us our sins are charged against him and if you understand that then you shouldn't have any confusion about it, about losing your salvation that's a transaction that was done and uh, this all the sins even the sins let's say you're going to sin tomorrow and five years from now and ten years from now all of that every sin until your last breath has already been put on him so how is sin going to prevent you from having eternal life if it was already put on Jesus Christ and his righteousness has already been credited to you? People rely on their own righteousness, Luke. What's that? They're, they rely on their own righteousness. They don't understand Roman, imputed righteousness. Romans 10, 3, as I said, they're attempting to establish their own righteousness, but that's not God's way. God's way is relying on the imputed righteousness of Christ. Let me... Uh, mention a couple of verses here and then i'm going to have to finish it up for the night for me uh it's uh, look at uh we mentioned this earlier uh, john 10 28 and 29 i give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand my father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand now let me give you a little picture illustration of this and uh if why is not why is not my uh, picture uh showing up as i'm talking do you have his uh did you click on uh brother dave's thing are you there am i you, still live you what yeah you are Okay. You're asking well, about brother. Well, something's not working right because usually when you talk, you're, you show up on the screen, but I'm not getting that. That's all right. I don't have to be on the screen. I wanted people to see my hands, though. Okay. So that's those scriptures says that 
Jesus has you in his hand. The Bible says the Father has you in his hand. So this is their grasp on you. And it says no one can pluck you out. <clears throat> if um, what, what more does it take to, for you to feel secure in your salvation? Uh, I like to illustrate another way, too. And that's, that's this way here. Uh, I have an icon on my channel. Uh, this is not the one, though. This is a different one. This, is, this looks like a cross, but it's actually a telephone pole with, with moss and stuff growing on it. But uh, I have another icon on my other on my channel that's a picture of Jesus' hand reaching, his nail-pierced hand reaching, and someone else reaching up for his hand. So imagine that through faith you embrace Jesus and you have this happen here. Jesus grabs a hold of you. He wants to, you to have eternal life. You embrace him in faith. Now you've, you've got it. He's got you in the palm of his hand. No one could pluck you out. People say, well, you can, you can pluck yourself out. You can leave, right? No, because even if I get, decide to go get in the pig's pen like the prodigal son, get, live a life of sin, he will never leave me or forsake me. No one can pluck me out of his hand. What happens if there's a crisis of faith and, and uh, I don't even believe anymore? Well, when we have no faith, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. He can't break the promise he made to us. I, I think that's, that should prove to everybody, that should illustrate to everybody uh, the kind of salvation and guarantee that we have. Uh, now, the last thing I want to mention is this, the closing verses is, this is what I hope everybody will come to understand and believe and they have this kind of confidence. We mentioned a verse earlier that said, I am confident that I have eternal life or something. Right. I was afraid. But this verse says I'm persuaded. It's Romans 8, 38, 39. Paul wrote, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, that's so the nothing now and nothing in the future. Nothing. Nothing. But what about, but, but, but what about, <laughs> but, but, but <laughs> what about this? <laughs> what about ism? Are you, are you a what about us now? Huh? Because it says nothing now. Nothing in the future can separate us. Nothing at all. Not not yeah. possible. Nothing. I mean, why, did, why didn't Paul? Why didn't Paul just say, I, "I'm persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord." Why didn't you just say that? He went every single possible scenario because yes. he didn't want to give you any wiggle room to to think that there's anything, anything you can conceive of. There's nothing you can right. conceive of that could make you lose your salvation. Yep. If that's that doesn't make you jump for joy, if you are not jumping for joy, I, I wonder if you even understand this great salvation. How I great know. is the salvation? So great a salvation, the unspeakable gift. Yeah. What the yeah. ones people mock, you know, yeah. ill, cheap, or, ill. Well, that's uh, that's my grand finale there. Uh, that's a good one, Luke. I need to I need to leave because I can only sit so long before I'm, uh, my body can't take it. Okay. So. Uh, I had a lot of a good time with everybody. Thank and, uh, you, brother. Uh, the last thing I will say to everybody is, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. Thanks, Luke. Uh, brother Luke, we love you, bro. Yeah, we love you. Um, brother Dave, I, again, I think this whole issue on eternal security is is all by people that don't believe the gospel. I mean, that's no, they 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 they, don't, they haven't. They haven't come to the end of themselves or they haven't been brought to a place where they have to absolutely turn and trust on Christ alone. Um, they're very confused, wondering, well, I know God is asking some things of me. I know God wants me to obey. I know I'm supposed to grow. I know I'm supposed to do this. And they're getting it muddied with the gift of salvation versus them moving their feet in life and service. And this is the best way I like to try to clear up that confusion. We get to heaven by whom we trust upon. We get our rewards and crowns and inheritances in heaven 
by our behavior and what we do for God here on earth. But you cannot mix the two. Salvation is a gift. Earning rewards and crowns and, and, and responsibilities and storing up treasure in heaven is not free. It takes your effort. But your effort must be in line with God working in you. You know in Philippians 2, it says that we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, which literally means with reverence and respect to God. Okay? We are working... We're working out our salvation, not for it. And then the right. very next verse, it says it's God who works in us and, and, and through us to do his will and good pleasure. Nothing that is of eternal value or nothing that truly glorifies God can be done apart from Christ. Uh, Brother Dave, the Old Testament tells us how to, how to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. The book of Psalms says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So we work our inner salvation out by serving and rejoicing. Yep. That's how And did do. you know? Did you know that eternal security is even all throughout the Old Testament? Oh yeah, of course. Blood David talks about blessedness of the man whose sins are not imputed, who to whom God will not impute sin. That's future tense. Will how about when God makes the promise to David that his line, which Christ would come through his line that all who would come to Christ thereafter shall be made heirs according to the promise, and that God says, even if they walk not in my statutes, I will visit them with the rod, meaning I'll give them divine yeah. discipline. God. But God says, nevertheless, my covenant and my promise stand assured. Stand I will Lord. not That's remove right. them from my loving kindness. That's right. And, and, you know, Jesus makes intercession for his people. Once they're given, he prays for them. You can see him praying for the disciples. Yeah, he Hebrews said, 7. I, he said, I lost none except the son of perdition, but he was never saved. It said he never believed in who would betray him. They knew that Judas never was saved, that Jesus picked him just so the scriptures would be fulfilled, that one of his disciples would lift up his heel against him. The one who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me and betrayed me. Remember, <laughs> it says that he was picked just to fulfill the scripture of betraying Jesus. He That's right. Jesus. Psalms 4, I think it's so, Psalms 40 something where he predicted the betrayal of Judas. And you can see that Christ is praying for us, his kids now. And John 17, 9, this is the area where he's praying for the disciples. Yes, All and he prays that God them. keep us. Yeah, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and mine are thine, and thine are mine. I am glorified in them, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to the Holy Father, keep through thine own Name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that gavest me, I have kept. So Jesus is keeping us and the Father. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, mm. that the scriptures might be fulfilled. See? It's so all know. throughout the scripture. Eternal security. It's all, it's the whole reason. It's everything is Christ. It's all about Christ. If we, ha we have no hope of glory apart from Christ. We have no hope of meeting God's standard of perfection apart from Christ. We have no hope of entering heaven apart from Christ. Anybody who thinks that they are going to perform their way into heaven is as a complete fool. Yep. They're and, he, and you know something, Renee, this is, this is cool. It's a little exercise that I like to share with people. And if they just get out a little notebook and they write the word must and the word should, and this should help them differentiate salvation from life and service. Okay. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What should I do once I'm saved? Be careful to maintain good works because these are profitable unto all men. So what must I do to be saved? Must is not the same as should. Yep. Must. I heard a video called shoulds versus musts. People there you confuse go. Them. They confuse them. It, I mean, it's very confusing, especially to people who aren't diligently spending time in the word praying, uh, asking God for wisdom and understanding. You know, I'll, I'll testify the story. When I first got saved, you know, I, I read the Bible five, six hours a day, and I had no clue what I was reading.
but I, I was determined in my heart to know God's word, and I, and I wasn't always motivated. You know, a lot of distractions, a lot of I don't feel like it today, a lot of other things, worldly things, fleshly things, whatever it was, because I was ba a babe back then. But I, de I determined in my heart, and it was my prayer, that God would teach me his word. So even though I wasn't always motivated, I had to train myself to be dedicated. And I spent hours upon hours. Uh, I read the book of John, the book of Acts. And, I, and I'll tell you, you know, many times I read chapters over and over and over and had no clue what I was reading. But I believe that at some point, you know, it says that God searches the reins of our heart. Jesus knows our heart. God knew that even though I didn't know what I was reading at the time, I wanted to, and I was seeking, and Jesus said, and God said in Jeremiah 33, if, if, if we seek him, he will show us things that we do not know or understand. And I believe God looked down in my heart, and he saw that I really wanted to learn, and I'll tell you what, after a while, the word started to make sense. Started to come into yep. memorization. Yep. Started to get stored in my mind and in my heart. It started to make sense. And, the, and, and God began to reveal little by little. And even though this is the key, we're not always motivated to spend time with God. We're not always motivated to diligently seek and study his word. But if we can train ourselves to be dedicated and with a heart of, of honesty, ask God for wisdom and seek his word, he will begin to reveal it to us. Yeah, you know, um, it's so clear to me the Bible is a supernatural book. And uh, I used to, I remember I went through that same situation with God. I was, I, I knew I was saved, but I didn't understand uh, scripture that well. And uh, I remember just, I would read something and it, it would confuse me or I would think it had something to do with my works. And I would just stand up and yell at him and go, well, who could stand then? If this yeah. was standing, who could stand? <laughs> and I would just talk to him. I'd be so mad. I'd be like, this, this, who can do this? <laughs> yeah, I, um, Yo, sis, I'm telling you one day I was reading the verse. Um, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, I literally like, I don't know if I was like, throwing a fit like a little baby, but I literally just slapped my Bible off the table and was like, why? Well, well, it's over now. I'm done. I'm going to hell. <laughs> and it's funny how, uh, you, you have to, I, I think something happens when you're fully convinced it's all Christ. Then the Holy spirit starts revealing scriptures. It the starts letting you see it. Like there were certain <laughs> verses I read. I saw differently. I saw uh, the ram caught by his horns. That's the crown of thorns. When, when that happens, the heart of stone is turned into a heart of flesh. But the scaled eye, the, the blind I, eyes are able to see. I had uh, read the, before, and, and they meant something different now, like uh, the verse, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. It had nothing to do with a person sinning more. It didn't say they used the grace of God as lasciviousness. It says they turned right. his grace into lasciviousness. So they'll say, no, you're not saved by grace because that would be a license to fornicate and a license to this. So they turn his grace into lasciviousness and then it gets people to reject grace. So I, I hadn't seen that before and I would see stuff like that and things like Christ is of no effect to you. Like all these things, warnings of trusting in ourselves. Yes. And they yes. started popping out of the scriptures. And then I was started, I was able more to divide what was about uh, how we should live once we're saved from what we got to do to be saved. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's what I get accused of. They, they, they think I tell people to, to, it doesn't matter if you sin and you don't have to love one another. Meanwhile, they're cruel and mean and calling me names. But right. <laughs> right. <laughs> You gotta love your brother, you idiot. Okay, okay. You know, I get that. I mean, it's so weird their hypocrisy. And uh, you know, um, a gentleman in the chat room a minute ago was saying, "Well, he said that if you don't forgive, your father in heaven won't forgive you." That is temporal forgiveness, by the way. Also, Jesus was preaching to Israel under the law that whole time. He's trying to show them the standards of the law. But about not being, not forgiving others, you won't be forgiven to be turned over to the tormentors. That's about your peace of mind. If you don't forgive, you're not going to have the forgiveness here on this earth temporarily. 
You're not going to dwell. And how can you get the fullness of God's forgiveness in your life if you're not willing to forgive somebody else? Paul says that we have no right not to forgive because we've already been forgiven. Right. And, and, you know, and it's it's that humility that brings us to realize but our forgiveness is not based on us being able to forgive others, it's not based on the work of forgiveness of others. Right. Right. And exactly. But we it and say, if you don't forget, don't tell me you forgave every person and don't have any little. Come on now. That that's another standard Jesus lifted up. Under and the that's the, to Israel. and that's another great aspect or quality of those of us who have come to the knowledge of the sufficiency of the finished work of Christ, because it really gets illuminated to us how much forgiveness God bestows on us. And we get to a place where we learn to bestow forgiveness, mercy, and grace on others. Um, and, and here's a, here's a key thing. Notice what you said about most of the people who are, who believe you can lose it or believe they're working or earning it, they're very cold, harsh, unforgiving, unloving, and they're very, uh, uh, very um, uh, slanderous and, and, and just ready to hit you with rocks. But Galatians 6.1 says, Brethren, those of you who see another brother in a fault, restore unto one gently with the spirit yeah. of meekness yeah. unless you be tempted. You yeah. see, these people don't come to you and say, Look, you know, or they don't guide you gracefully. They don't, they don't have mercy on you. They don't have, they just condemn you, call you wicked, call you false, call you this. They, they can't even follow the instructions of the spirit. That's what the hypocrisy is. That's what cracks me up. I'm just like, wow, do you see how ugly you're being? Like some of the things said and done to me are just unbelievable. It's like, I, I suffer so much. I'm doing so good now. Praise God. Thank God for my, everybody praying for me. My, I'm, I'm walking again and out of the wheelchair. And I mean, I still take medicine. I, I, you know, but the pain was just excruciating to the point where I was standing up until I was falling over from exhaustion. I knocked the IV out of my neck. I was so tired. I couldn't sit down or lay down because of the nerve was under the SI joint. And I was suffering so much. And it's like the, the worst I was suffering physically and I was no sleep. These people would come and just, beat me to pieces it was amazing i even yeah came back i i was already suffering so much and i'm just like you people no wonder people don't come to christ this is who's representing him it's horrible and they can't see it like you said they see these big sins they don't fornicate and they don't drink alcohol so they don't sin anymore and they can't see like how black and evil their heart is towards people huh. so it's just it's crazy the hypocrisy of it all. None of us are saying to go out and just be mean to people. And, it's, and you know, and it's 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 it's, it's what teaches good. us that that us us who who know that we fail God, but we know in whom we believe. We know in whom we trust. And and we get back up. We get back in the race. We move forward one foot at a time. Sometimes we take five steps forward and 25 backwards. Sometimes we're just free falling backwards, but rest assured, God will leave the 99 to come get the one. I mean, I am that one that he came to get and I can't deny. I can't deny it. Our he confidence has to be in him. And that again, salvation and we're kept saved by God. God saved us. I, I just don't understand how they could say you can lose it when it's God that saved us. It's, his uh, he reached out and he saved us. His plan is here. It is here's the free gift of eternal life. Take it. It's yours. I paid for it. The work is done for you. It says the works are finished from the foundation of the world. That's what salvation's based on. The work Jesus already did. How can yeah. you lose it unless he went back it's and got off the cross and time traveled? Exactly. Yeah. And and you know it kills me that they say, oh well. Jesus only paid for your past sins. Well, you know, when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, all of them are paid for them. Everybody, everybody to come after Christ was a future sin. So, uh, yeah, you nobody know, was alive back then. I mean, we weren't even alive. They were all future. See, that's but, how they limit stuff with their carnal thinking. And if it's just from the moment you believe, okay, and I'm, and I got to maintain my salvation by my works. I mean, you get it by faith. But you keep it by works? Your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. How are they going to keep you saved? 
Yeah. You can't maintain God's righteousness with your own stupid, filthy rags. Get out of here with that. It's That's and you know they use the they use the verse that says, uh, "Let nobody deceive you. He that doeth righteous is righteous." Well, yeah, well, he who reads a lot is a reader. It's just a statement of fact. Exactly. Or or he who you know he who drinks a lot of coffee ha gets you know a caffeine a headache. Drinker. Yeah, I mean, come on. It's just. It's just saying, oh, never mind. I'm not going to get into First John, but, but now, uh, you know, you know, sis. It just, you know, those of us who 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 have come to the simplicity of the gospel, you know, where where God says, "I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it yeah. is the power of God power of unto God. salvation right. for all who believe." That's you right. know, we we realize how merciful and long suffering and forgiving God is toward us, and it, and it keeps us. Uh, in a place of, it's almost like a divine protection from allowing us to grow in this hardened, prideful self-righteousness, like you sinner, you know, like it, it keeps us humble and, and see God even said he resists the proud, but he will give more grace unto the humble. You know, I, I believe no matter what you're struggling with, no matter, you know, um, you know, you may wrestle with certain sins that I no longer wrestle with. I may wrestle with sins you no longer wrestle with, but rest assured, every single human being listening to this broadcast tonight is wrestling with some type of sin in their life. They forget and, anger, pride, sloth, and it's not going to be fully eradicated. Sleeping, sleeping too much, hanging out, watching TV too much, laziness. So they forget all of it. We all fall short. Right. It's, like it's only the little. How about the thoughts of foolishness? Or how about anything done not in faith? Or how about the good deeds you know to do, but you don't do? Yep. Sin of omission. Sin you don't even know you commit. There's stuff I do wrong. I don't even know what's wrong. Yep. And I've always, and you know, and I love, I love the testimony of God's grace because I'll tell people straight up where I failed God a million times because my heart is postured towards Christ in complete trust. God's grace has showed up a million and one, a million and two, a million and three. However much I need God's grace to help me get back up and keep going, he will supply it. Why? Because I, I continue to trust in him. Yeah, I don't look to myself. Grace. And, and it reminds me of Galatians when, when those people started to believe that you had to be circumcised afterwards. He's like, oh, foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you that you right. could not obey the truth? And begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Yep. I mean, it. it's crazy, but it's true. I, I mean, I know that some, I mean, that's talking about a ceremonial thing in the flesh, but it's any work in the flesh. You, you can't. And then if you go to uh, Acts, the apostles were trying to work it out. You know, do they got to become, get into Judaism to be, you know, they were trying to figure all this out. And they basically said this. Okay, well, we don't want to lay a burden on them. So tell the disciples, this isn't even believers. These are apostles going out to preach to others. Tell them to stay away from meat offered to idols and for fornication and, and things strangled and they should do well. Then Paul later tells them, well, it doesn't even matter if you eat something offered to an idol because what's an idol? So see how we, they have progressive revelation in scripture and people don't get it. They don't divide the progressive revelation. You know, and so uh, that was all the burden they laid on apostles. Stay away from fornication and uh, meat offered idols. You should do well. That was it. There was no uh, burden on them and that they were going out to represent Christ. So I don't know why people it says they that demand we keep the law. They themselves don't keep it. But what 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 kills me is that the reason they say you can lose it is because they think you can send it away. You can send away the blood of Jesus and then, right. and they're somehow maintaining their salvation by how good they live. Again, right. And that's, you don't get it by grace and then keep it by works. And that is the subtle, that is the subtle wall that keeps them from coming to the truth of the gospel. That's their go-to thing, uh, bro. They'll go, Oh no, it's not me doing it. It's God doing it in me. So they can add their works to it. So they can, yeah. you know, no, it's still not about how you're living. It, it's not based on that work at all. It's based on work already done. And and it just, it makes me crazy that people can 
are preaching this. I go on Sid Roth every night. He's got somebody once saved, always say it's a doctor of the devils. And then with their double talking mouth, go, oh, give me the assurance. Help me rip. And what assurance and how good you are? Because you've already <laughs> said you could lose it. You know, it's it's just ridiculous. So many false prophets, and they're all charismatic with their weird, like, manifestations. Oh, yeah. Sid, Roth, Sid Roth's show is, is completely open to all types of uh, wolves and merchandisers and and people that deny the Lord's sufficiency. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a counterfeit move of of I believe Satan to to counterfeit uh, biblical Christianity and make people think that it's about them and their experiences and their feelings right. and you know right. here's the thing here's the thing for people for people that are truly on the fence for people that truly don't get it. Let me present it to you this way. And this is a very simple method that I like to teach people at my local Bible study every Thursday night. If you truly believe that your deeds, your obedience, and your works, and your fruit bearing do determine your salvation, then please provide to me or anyone in the chat the scripture that tells us when we've hit the acceptable bar. If you can find the scripture where God says, okay, you've done this amount of good works, you've bored this amount of fruit, you've uh, put away this many sins, and you've grown to this level of, of holiness, I'll accept you. Where is that verse in Scripture? It's not found. Nobody's accepted by God on their own merits. And people pick up, pick up things like uh, in the Old Testament where Noah was perfect in his generations. By the way, that's uh, physical genetics. That's not perfect in his generations doesn't right but, and it uh, says that job was a righteous and upright man right, that was because right. of his faith yeah he yeah it's because of who he trusted and look he even offered blood for his children he offered the blood atonement he realized his place before god and that only the blood would satisfy pay for sin he didn't understand all of it uh, that's the oldest book in the bible that was it may have been written before the law some say it came over on the ark with noah we don't know you well, know there's not a there's not a single scripture in the entire bible from genesis to revelation that ever speaks on or teaches of or clarifies anybody being born again more than once yeah and no exactly nobody once lost always lost they uh they use things like perfect and just and upright and and righteous and all that in the old testament but they they call Lot that, but he had sex with two of his daughters, started two pagan nations, gave the well watered fields to Abraham, offered his virgin daughters <laughs> to rapists. Yep. I mean, the guy was not righteous because of his works. He was righteous because he believed God. <laughs> King David, a man after God's own heart. Not only did he commit, uh, you know, adultery with Bathsheba, but he turned around and tried to cover up his sin with a more grievous sin and committed murder. murder. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, what was his punishment? The sword never left his house. It said that. That was his punishment. He didn't lose salvation. Look, there, the, one of the viewers said there's a difference between losing the joy of salvation, losing the fellowship, losing your walk, and losing salvation. There isn't a place in Scripture where you lost salvation. They tried to use King Saul. God departed from Saul in regards to running the country. Yep. Ruling the country. He couldn't hear from God anymore to rule the country. He gave it to David. It had nothing to do with eternal salvation. When the prophet Saul, Samuel, came up and spoke to Saul, he said, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Where was the prophet? In paradise. Uh, I'm assuming one of God's prophets were saved, didn't you? So oh, absolutely. Samuel the prophet, I'm assuming he's saved too. So well, it, uh, it's really... King, uh, King, Saul, King Saul is a prime example of of a carnal, rebellious yep. child of God who yep. God had to chastise severely and Samson. bring to a physical death. Look at Samson. Samson too. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of, uh, of examples of, of people in God's word who went on to maturity and, and received many blessings of God. And there are people who went in the opposite direction as disobedient children. As Timothy says, Look at Jonah. he ran from him. Yeah, you know, but you once you're God's child, you can't run from him. You can't stop being his child. You can't be unborn out of his family. You are his. You know, I hear so many stupid things like, well, you can be lose your inheritance. You can be unadopted. You can be like God's going to forsake you based on what? 
his his son's blood wasn't enough. Here's what you can lose, sis. Blood, either the blood atonement paid for me or it didn't. And that's it. That's the only issue because without right. shedding a blood, there is no remission. But because right. God Himself shed His own blood, my sins are remiss. They're gone. They will right. never be held against me. He said it will move them as far as the east is from the west. They're he remiss our sins and iniquities no more. Eternity on Judgment Day, they will not be remembered. That's it's right. Not happen. Now, from my understanding and my years of study, you know, it's this is what I believe a, a true child of God can lose. They can lose a close, intimate fellowship with God. They can lose peace of their salvation, joy of their salvation. They can lose uh, confidence in their salvation. They can lose um, heavenly rewards, certain crowns that God offers. They can lose uh, their right or responsibility to co-reign with Christ in the kingdom. There are things that we can lose, but salvation is not one of them. That's right. And, and you know, and this is why we do exhort the grace community to grow in the grace of God, as Titus says, that grace teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and, and, and godly in this present world. Doesn't mean we do it perfectly, but we strive or we allow God's grace to push us and give us that desire. And here's an example. Like I told you in, the, in the, uh, last week's uh, video, I struggled with a certain sin. God allowed me to go so deep into that sin that, that it was only by his grace that I began to then feel a certain disgust for it. And I felt a certain, a different desire not to engage in it, but I had to go basically neck deep into that sin. Right. So you got so uh, sick of it. Until I got sick of it and I just wasn't compelled to, to chase after it anymore. But that wasn't by me beating down my flesh. That wasn't by me forcing my will. That was the grace of God teaching me. Right. Yeah, there were just some things like it, something did happen. Like I used to uh, think it was funny. I'd go into a store and like pick up a necklace and put it on and walk out right right at the cash register just to see if they'd catch me. Just to, <laughs> I just thought it was funny. I mean, that, I used to do stuff like that. You know, I didn't think there was anything wrong. They were a big corporation. You know, just, I don't know. It was wrong. But now I can't. It, it was like, I guess. 10 years ago, maybe nine years ago, I walked out to the Walmart. You got to remember at this time I was on a walker. I was in a lot of pain and I was barely walking, leaning on my left side. So for me to get back out to the car after I just started driving again and have to go all the way back in was a big deal for me because it was a lot of pain and a lot of trouble. So I got all the way out to my car and found a $1 item in the bottom of my thing that at the self checkout, it ha I hadn't checked out. It was under the bags when I threw the bag in the thing. But I mm -hmm. found it and I was like, uh, well, it's just a dollar. And I was like, no, this is not th this is a big deal right here. My son is here. He's going to see this. He cannot think it's OK if it isn't worth a lot. No, what's wrong is that my God is here with me and he sees it. Also, it fe I felt like something bigger was at stake. So when I took it back in, I went all the way back in. I did not want to because I was in pain. So I went all the way back in and it ended up that the lady like needed her faith restored in people. She was having a tough day. So, you know, sometimes uh, certain things just aren't okay with our heart anymore. Like it, it's not like I couldn't take things anymore. I couldn't steal. That was something that uh, made me sick to think about. Like I literally felt physical pain at yeah. the time of doing it. Do you know what I mean? I, I, uh, you know, I, I went neck deep into pornography in the first couple of years of my walk. And this is before, you know, this was right around the time I would say on the third year of my walk after like literally shadowing my pastor around for like two years, learning as much as I could. I, I believe God called me into ministry and he Satan gave me a, uses that one a lot to get Christian men. And, and he gave, you know, he gave me a, a, a platform and he gave me a, a, a bunch of people that just started coming to me without my consent. So I was like, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And he told me in my spirit, I want you to preach the word. And so I, I knew, I knew that I was struggling with pornography and long story short, I, I went neck deep into the sin and eventually the grace of God got a hold of me. And I began to see, you know, I began to look at it with different eyes and I, and I just started to feel sorry for the people. And I started to feel filthy and I started to feel like I, I could just feel how demonic it was. And I just was like, ugh, 
And I just lost the desire for it. I don't know how to explain it. It was the grace of God that did it. It wasn't me. Yeah. And and one of the things that I've uh, helped me is to be reminded of who God says I already am. Yes. Like, I don't I don't live right to be that person. God says I already am that person. So I need to act like it. You know, that that's what's up, brother Tony. Brother that, Tony joined the chat. <laughs> where is he? He's in there. Uh, the other day, me and brother Tony and a couple other brothers, we went out to the park out here in New Jersey and uh, God had a divine appointment for us with two gentlemen out there. It was beautiful, man. We did some powerful praying for him. We uh, spoke the word of God with him and, and, you know, they, they already claimed to be believers, but they had, you know, not heard anything or kind of fallen away from God. And we just happened to meet them in the park that day and, and they got, you know, they got uh, brought back to life, so to speak. Well, hey, brother Tony, thanks for coming and hanging out. We were talking about eternal security, uh, our blessed assurance in Christ um, tonight, but now we're just kind of chit-chatting about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sis, if, if, if it wasn't, okay, if here's the thing. If, okay, let's, let's just look at this in a real, logical, simple reasoning. If we could lose our salvation, <coughs> what would cause us to lose it? Would it be our sin? And if it is our sin, then... 100% of people who claim to be believers would eventually lose it That's within right. a month. That's within right. a month. They if not every day. day. Come on, they'd lose it. Okay, they, okay, they okay. Like every anger, day. But, anger, unforgiveness. But uh, I'm being whatever. generous. I'm being yeah. generous in saying that, okay, even the most. Everybody lose it. Spirit-filled, yeah. holy-walking, righteous man or woman that, that consecrates themselves to God and does all this obedience. Listen, a month. I give it a month before they fail God again. And if we could lose our salvation, we definitely would. And if it's because of sin, we would lose it at least once a month. Right. But where, where in the Bible does it talk about how to get reborn again, again, and again? They, they use the verse in Hebrews to say once lost, always lost. If you get saved and you lose it, it's impossible to renew them again to repent and see they crucify the son of God afresh a, a second time. They don't get the, the verses in Hebrews and what they're about. So they think you get saved, and then you're lost, and then you can never be saved again. You know what lordship salvation? You know, what, see, legalism, legalism, and lordship salvation. What they do to people, sis, is they they put people in such confusion, such um, their eyes get turned off of Christ onto themselves. They get full of co uh, co condemnation, and they begin to get afraid. They feel I'm so far from God. I've failed so much. I've committed. They, they, they leave the faith. Because they don't and have they don't. that kind of fear. They don't want to think about it anymore. They get confused. I've had so many people say that. I almost left the faith or killed myself or did something crazy because they were right. so condemned and they were sick of being condemned. Hey, if I'm going to go to hell, let me have fun. I just, I can't, I can't even. That's why the message of the real gospel's got to be fought for. The false message kills people. It really does. I mean, it's serious. Some people get really like depressed and suicidal because they, they have no hope. We've got to contend for it. This is why we read that verse earlier that says unto a living hope. Yes. Because our hope is found in who he is and what he's already done. It's like, it's like this. It's like this. If I'm at the airport and I need a ride and I call up the Uber I call the Uber. I say, look, I just got off my plane. I need a ride. I'm at the airport. I'm trusting that Uber to come and pick me up and take me home. Like who, like, do you understand what I'm saying? If I'm at the airport and I have no ride, I have to call Uber and I have to just sit there and wait for them to come while trusting that they are coming to pick me up. I have to live my life in faith in the person and finished work of Christ, knowing that when I take my last breath, I have kept my eyes and my faith on Christ, and I'm trusting that he'll bring me home. Me too. That's the hope set before us. All right, it's midnight now. I better. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. sis, you had, a, you had a very strong message tonight. You, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that Brother Luke was able to join us. Thank you for having me on. Me too, and, and always, as always, beautiful people in the chat. The Grace community is, is just, is just uh, you know, I'm just so thankful for everyone. And, and, and you know, and it's, it's just so good to get to a place where you know in whom you believe and in whom you trust. 
And it's so good to get to a place to know that even if you fail, you can turn to God and, and, and he's so forgiving and he's so merciful. You know, it really is true that God will search the reins of our heart. And, you know, he knows, he knows, he knows when we, you know, he knows you can't hide anything from God. And I'm going to be real right now. And I'm going to say that there are times where each and every one of us does something we know we shouldn't do. As the Holy Spirit of God will say, no, that's probably not a good idea. The devil will say, yeah, why not? Just go for it. And then you say, no, nah, I don't want to do that. And you wrestle back and forth. And sometimes you still do it anyway. It's just the truth. Like, I don't believe in lying. So, you know, you just about, I, I believe in keeping it real. And even in those times, God is still merciful to us. And he still clean. He still restores us, refreshes us, refills us with his spirit. Like, like, yes, there are dry seasons. There are wilderness seasons. There are times where you feel like God has literally thrown you in a desert and completely left you. But if you continue to seek, you continue to walk on in faith one step at a time, he will come and restore, refresh, and refill you yep. yet again. Yep. Yep. The, the, the whole thing is if you want to have joy and peace, and security keep your eyes on jesus all the time like brother luke says i'm thinking about jesus all the time i'm not thinking about bad stuff i'm thinking Amen. i'm rejoicing in what he's done for me and if i'm always reminded of his mercy and his grace and his sacrifice for me it's a lot harder to hate sis it's renee do you harder. see what uh dynamics was saying in the chat uh about what it says, why should, I, why should I ever do that? I've prayed and prayed for God to help me, and he's just silent. Okay, well, let me ask you this. You with what, honey? Yeah, dynamics. What is your, what is your okay. concern? What do you mean that you've prayed and prayed to God, but he's just silent? Yeah, we, uh, I mean, if, if it, are you talking about deliverance from something or... Because I don't know. They, well, I don't know if he heard us. This is, for one, whatever it is, prayer. The answer is not always yes. Okay, Second, he said God will they, always give us what we need. Thirdly, if you do really trust Christ, you're still going to struggle with the flesh, honey. Saint Paul said, "The thing that the good that I would that I don't. The thing that I hate that I do. Who will save me from this body of death?" And you know where his hope laid on the future. One day he will be free from this body of death. Till now. Until that happens, his grace is sufficient for us. Okay, Dynamics grace said that he's that he's already lost everything. He's believed for some time, but there's no change. What then they said everything. Do you mean physical stuff? I lost everything too. As a matter of fact, all my I had two Mercedes. I had a career in the movie business. I didn't even have a place to live. I was being bounced around uh, on couches between friends and family. I had to move back home. To Virginia, I lost all that, but guess what? Uh, and th all my health too. So uh, I ended up in the hospital, disabled with nothing, scared to death. But guess what? That forced me to seek God, and now He's been working on me ever since, and He's starting to restore those things. So He will give you what you need all the time. He will provide your needs if that's a an issue. Sometimes and dynamic, Dynamics is saying they've been keeping their eyes on Jesus, but there's no change in their life. Okay, hold on. When when uh, Sometimes you your cup's got to be emptied before you can fill it again. So that's about right. stuff. So I'm not broken sure. down to be rebuilt. But what is the, what do you mean there's no change? Maybe God's working on something else and you're trying to get this over here worked on and he's going, no, I need this worked on first. You don't, you see what I'm saying? Like, I thought he'd take away all my flesh habits first, right? You know, everything out here would be fixed. No, he worked on other stuff first inside, and slowly that stuff's coming off. It takes time. Yes, so the inward the inward working of the heart, the, the, the digging up of the deeply rooted junk that we came to Christ. When we come to Christ, here's how I like to put it. When we come to Christ, uh, we're coming with a shirt that contains many wrinkles, and sometimes if you ever iron a shirt, the wrinkles don't come out unless you heat the, the iron up a lot hotter. And then you got to press a little harder and then the wrinkle will come out. We all have wrinkled shirts in God's eyes and God's grace and the Holy Spirit will iron us out wrinkle by wrinkle. And, and sometimes it's not how we expect. 
it's not on our time or what we desire, but sometimes God will dig up certain roots or iron out certain wrinkles that we may not even be completely aware that we're a big problem in our life. I think he might need to abide in God's love more and to know how precious he is to God and to yes. know who God says you are. I, if you're looking for spiritual growth and you're already saved, you're trusting, I would suggest the book by Watchman Nee called The Spiritual Man. You can download it online for free. The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee. This is about experiential growth and uh, experiential sanctification, our walk with God to overcome these things of the flesh. It's very helpful. So, uh, but and you, not to, to you know, don't, don't run ahead of yourself. Be patient. Right. Sometimes take your time, slow down, enjoy a, a close fellowship with God in private time. And you Just know, like you know, you are, don't think he's not pleased with me. He doesn't love me until I get over this. Maybe, right. he's, maybe he's letting you remain in that so that you're dependent upon him and you need his grace. You yes. know, if you start thinking we're too good out here in the flesh and we got it all together, then we stop remembering we need his grace. It's his grace that's sufficient for us. Like, I worry less about people that have some little habit than I do. I worry more about people that think they're good now. I'm so good. You know, in the churches, those are the ones I worry about, not the ones that struggle with a habit or something. Because I know God is working on all of us. But I, I hope that you can don't postpone your joy and your peace, because if you've trusted Christ, you've got nothing but a good future ahead of you. But the world here is tough. The world here, it says those who live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. We're going to have troubles while we're on this earth. But God will give us the ability to have joy and peace uh, while we're here. These prosperity preachers tell you, if you believe in Jesus, everything will be good. Your money, your this. No, that's not always true. That's not always true. Uh, his kingdom is not of this world. We have uh, other riches. But as far as like stuff, your needs, he'll provide your needs. He'll bless the work of your hands. He'll do all those things for you. Yes, he will open doors for you to for you to work. He'll open right. doors for you to have what you need. Yes, he will. God will always supply our needs, but not our greeds. Right. Yeah, there you go. So I, I'm not sure because exactly what you're talking about, but if you're talking about you have some issues and it hasn't changed yet, I, I would suggest that book by Watchman Nee. The spiritual man, it's really good for a Christian to grow in discipleship and not condemnation. A lot of times, see, the strength of sin is the law. And some of us still have that legalistic stuff in our own head, thinking God won't love us until we get over this certain sin or something. You've got to stop that. you got to know God loves you now and you're his child. And he's going to help you. He knows your heart. If he knows you're struggling against the flesh, we have a compassionate high priest who suffered as we did, but yet without sin. So he can understand, you know, so I, I stay away from the condemnation and let God work that out in you. That's, that's what I would hope because condemnation never does anything, but push you further into sin and away from God. Yes. Amen. Yeah. You know? But thank you saints for coming tonight. I am so at, we had 120 some almost 130 people in the chat tonight. I have, I've never seen anything like that. That's fantastic. Hey, sis, at one point you had 144. <laughs> 144 people in the chat. Wow, that's fantastic. Or 144 people watching at one point. But it, it maintained between 120 and 110 for, for the whole time. Well, that's great to have that many people fellowshipping. And moderators, Hendrix, all you guys, Victoria, Celine, uh, all of you, thank you so much for uh, keeping it civil in the chat room. I really appreciate that. I don't block people for disagreeing with me. Uh, I just don't like anybody to be ugly or accusing or anything like that. Well, I'm going to tell you what, the highlight of my night was when the guy came at you and I felt in the spirit to defend you because I've witnessed and discerned and seen the fruit of the labor that Christ is doing through you. So I felt the need to come to your, to your defense and then boom, Shortly after, here comes God with the validation yeah. and the confirmation. As the lady said, there's so much confusion out there. I have discernment, 
but my this is bearing witness with my spirit, and I'm so glad God led me here. Oh, okay. so uh, anybody that's coming against this sister has yet to come to any understanding of salvation. And I pray they get it. That's why I keep fighting. And that's it. This is what we do. This is why we contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. This is why we contend for the gospel. Those who preach the simple, true, pure gospel will receive the same accusations, the same attacks, and the same uh, opposition as the Apostle Paul did. This is how we know we're preaching the true gospel. Yep, that's true. Thank you so much, Brother Dave. I know your back was hurting. I hope it feels better. Oh, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. I'm, I'm good. You know, I love talking about the Lord and fellowshipping and, Dude. you know, in this lost and crazy and dying world, you know, people say, I never understood how Christians can say, oh, well, you know, the Bible's boring and talking about God is boring. Not like, it, I never get bored with it. Me either. Me either, bro. All right. Uh, I will be on the Bible study tomorrow night, you guys. 930 on Sin City Preacher with Brother uh, Cripps. From True Story Live and Brother Luke tomorrow night. We're still in the book of First Corinthians and hope to see you there. All right. God bless you guys. Good night. Good night, y'all.